All right, so with this Nitro show. But first, we start with Monday Nitro. Nitro number 183, March 15th, 1999. David Flair is shown checking into a hotel. Mrs. Robinson from the NWO skit last week steps up, tries to flirt with him. He pays no attention to her, but she still followed after him. Yeah, he's, he's too high and mighty. He's a big television star now. He is big time. He just blows her off. I will say that this... I hated this stupid stuff that they had with David and Mr. Robinson. It's like someone came up with one funny idea. Let's have an older woman seduce David. Mm -hmm. We'll call her Mrs. Robinson. Yeah. It'll all build to the high spot. Mrs. Robinson, are you trying to seduce me? Mm -hmm. It's fucking horrible. <laughs> it's just <laughs> fucking terrible. Just because you come up with a funny idea doesn't mean it's a good idea. Right. Right? And that you should devote it to stretch it out over two television programs. Two television programs. and I assume it's done now. God only knows how many weeks. Who knows? And not to mention, why would you have a hamburger when you have steak at home? Well, Craig. Because hamburger is delicious. We well, found out he had steak at home. That's true. Right. He didn't have a hamburger. A flaw in their plan. And besides, Craig, what's wrong with having steak and hamburger? Well, I mean, not an analogy, lot. but I'm just pointing out that, you know, let's go. Speaking mm -hmm. of having steak and hamburger, here's, uh, they're talking about Ric Flair. This is steak and hamburger. Ric Flair is steak and hamburger. He is the, he, the steak is a title, and the hamburger is president for his lifetime. That's uh, another analogy. We'll talk about yeah. the other one when he actually shows up in the show. So Flair, the night before, had defeated Hulk Hogan in, uh, at Uncensored in the barbed wire cage match. Somehow. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they never really went into detail. Oh, would you like me happened? to tell you how, or should we well, just like... Before you tell me, let me tell you what I got out of the show, because I know Arn Anderson interfered, and he passed Flair a tire iron... And I know Charles Robinson made a questionable decision in benefiting Ric Flair. Right. But I saw some people, or uh, there was some uh, dialogue about people saying that Flair was bleeding first, so it was kind of like a first blood cage match. Okay. And then Hogan said, you were bleeding and I pinned you. So it was a, I don't, what, what the hell happened? So it was a first blood cage match. A first blood barbed wire cage match. Which I don't remember them talking about last week. So never never mentioned the day it. of the show. Not mentioned yeah. one time. So it's a first blood cage match. Flair bled. Little Nate said, it's a superficial wound. Mm. Match must continue. I see. Hogan pinned Ric Flair, but Little Nate would not count. Then the tire iron got in the ring, and Hogan was clonked with it. Flair put him in the figure four, and then Little Nate did a fast count. Why are there pinfalls and submissions in a first blood match? Well, you can win via pinfall or submission or blood. Unless it's a superficial wound. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Wasn't this like the last big buy rate WCW did? Uh, yeah, probably. I wonder why. Yeah, this is bullshit. <laughs> no one wanted to pay for that kind of thing anymore? No. They also showed pics from Uncensored of Mikey Whipwreck making his debut. Oh, yeah, this famous match. Yeah, he got in trouble for this. This is one where they got heat for having a match that was too good. Yeah. That's right. We want you to have a bad match, Kidman. The opener on this. Even more, we want you in your first match in the company, Mikey. Yeah, don't be good. Go Just stink like, up the joint. Make your money. Yeah. Kim and one. Yeah. Lodi and the Nitro Girls were at the University of Cincinnati. Lodi is still employed and, in fact, was signing autographs. Yeah. <laughs> they thought he was Billy Idol. No. Not anymore. <laughs> it's impossible. We had picks of Jerry Flynn versus the Cat and Sonny Ono. I'm not sure who won that. It was last week. I don't even remember. No, it was on, on, on Uncensored. Oh, and Uncensored? Yeah, I don't care. Okay. So then... I, I, I presume Ernest Miller. I guess. I'll find out. Cat did the press conference earlier today. So he's trying to be Muhammad Ali. Is that Ali. what that was? That's what he said. I could not figure out what the fuck was going on. So what? Do we, Cat's in a uh, like a director's chair. Sonny Ono's next to him. And they got like a fancy cat graphic backdrop. And there's three people in chairs asking him questions. God this damn, Jerry Flynn beat Ernest Miller and Sonny Ono in a handicap match. Mm -hmm. I, I think cause one of the reporters, finger quotes reporters, one of the reporters was trying to ask, uh, Cassidy was still undefeated. And the reporter said, what about Jerry Flynn? And Cat flew off on a, flew off, I want to, what do you go, flying off the handle? Yeah. Started shooting out this reporter, harassed him, and finally left. Yeah, this was, this was... Just bizarre. I couldn't figure out what was going on. Yeah. It was like no press conference I've ever seen. No. I've been to some bad press conferences. And we've seen some on NXT. Yeah. And, then we had the match of the year. 
<laughs> this was awesome. Am I wrong? This was awesome. I couldn't believe when I tweeted out that the first half hour of this Nitro was like the greatest TV show I've ever seen. And Lance goes, Ray and Kidman, or whatever the match was later. I don't even remember it was so. I mean, it was a good match and everything like that. But mm. how do you how do you not know I'm talking about Meng and Jerry Flynn? This match was awesome. These two big mofos get in the ring and just destroy each other. They beat the shit out of each other. They're going 100 miles an hour the whole time, just chopping each other and kicking each other and throwing each other around. meng has got the baggiest pants of all time on. It looked like a skirt. Oh, it's his new outfit he wears forever. Does he yeah. wear this forever? Yeah, I forgot he wears these. it for a long time. I remember eventually he gets like the gold ones. Yeah. That, that may have been when he went back to WWF, I forget. But regardless, yeah, this went on... Well, I didn't go on forever. Went on three or four minutes of wonderful, glorious violence. You know what it was? They they hit each other a lot. Yes. There were a couple of pro wrestling moves. But even those were mm-hmm. like... Meng was a bear. But yeah. what was great about it, there were two things that were great about it. Number one, the fans were totally into this match. Yes. This crowd was awesome. And number two, if you guys recall, in the 90s, it was always like, what would happen if Meng fought in the UFC? <laughs> Right? <laughs> yes. This was what would fucking happen in our imagination. Yes. Like, Meng's just, he's hes mauling this guy like a bear. Yeah. And then Flynn takes him down, mounts him, goes for a straight arm bar, and Meng just tongues his way out. That's a verb. Yeah. Wails on him again. And then Jerry Flynn takes him down, tries another arm bar. Meng tongues his way out. And then he does the ha ta ta ha and he puts on the thing on his neck. I was like, fuck yeah! That was a finish! I am sweating, and I love this match. I want you to come back doing a Meng gimmick. <laughs> oh my god, I'd die. Mini Meng. The best part of this, and it, 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 it He's or- still working. I'm sure he is. It's probably still dangerous and scary. Oh, the best part of this, and it overlaps with some of the stuff you were talking about, there was a long sequence where they were... They were fighting, and they were punching, and they were grappling, but it was for like a minute where neither guy was ever on his feet. They were trading strikes in their knees, or they were rolling around on the ground, yeah, it was or a they fight. were grappling. It was a fight, exactly. And then Meng won with the Tongan death grip. A very fun opener. The only thing I didn't like about it was the finish. Why did Jerry Flynn, who has been winning and won on the pay-per-view, have to job to Meng? You know, I was absolutely baffled. I like couldn't figure out what was going on, but I liked the match, so I just gave up. Okay. I mean, this is WCW. That's the least of our problems, so... Yeah, the, the, the question is, did they present a fun television segment? Yes. The answer is yes. Winner. <laughs> Rackman was at a Nitro party. That's what I wrote. Yeah. We had clips of Beach Brawl from MTV. It was taped in Cancun during, I guess, spring break. I remember this. I actually remember one spot. It was, it was the first time I'd seen it. Uh, they've, they've done it probably a bunch of other times, but it was... Jericho, Ray, and Saturn. And Jericho is perched on the middle rope in the corner. Ray charges across the ring, and Saturn presses him over his head, and Ray lands on Jericho, hits a Hurricane Rana. Wow. It was awesome. But they didn't show that part, of course. What they showed was the announcers, which was Raven, Jimmy Hart, and Kid Rock. Oh, my. An amazing trio. What a coincidence. Uh, Do you realize Dave and the Observer wrote, Nitro in Cincinnati had another terrible first hour? Uh, huh. What was he watching? Don't you know. kidding me? This first hour rule. The first two matches were fun. Man, oh man. You had Mrs. Robinson joining David in the elevator, where there was conveniently a camera, just to show them standing there. And they got out of the elevator, and David went in to go, to go into his room. Mrs. Robinson said, oh, my key is not working. Can I use your phone? He said, fine. Now, can I go down to the front desk and get a new key? Well, she didn't want to. It was too far. Well, easier to use the phone. Yeah. Picks of Raven, Bigelow, and Hack in a hardcore match. Again, I have no idea who won. Well, they said that Raven was done in by his sister at the pay-per-view. Actually, Raven lost. Yeah. But I don't know who won. Well, that's irrelevant, obviously. (laughs) They didn't tell us. It is. So, we're back in the Nitro Party, and they start inviting wrestlers to these things now. So, I love they invited... Raven to the Nitro Party. And he's there. He, it's not that he got invited, Vinny. Right. He went. He went. Yeah. Raven's whole gimmick is he sulks in the corner mm-hmm. and never talks to anybody. And that's what he did at this Nitro Party. Yeah, I thought I was there. <laughs> so <laughs> Raven's much cooler than you. So they talk about Chastity turning on Raven at Uncensored, and Raven makes jokes about Dutch ovens and Jerry Falwell and bondage. That was weird. Mm-hmm. Trust me, I'd be more fun at the party than Raven. This one that's actually what he's talking right. about. 
Chris Adams versus Rick Steiner. Oh my God, what a battle! I love this match. You know I don't even know what happened. What do you mean you don't know what happened? Well, like they're having a match, uh huh, and then they beat the shit out of each other, right? And they started punching each other in the face as hard as they could, and then Taylor tries a double leg. Adams? Rick Steiner Adams. just drives his hip into him to break it. I'm sorry, uh, Chris Adams drives his hip into him to stuff it, and then they just started wrestling again, mm-hmm. like nothing had happened. Well. Chris Adams hit him really hard, and then Rick hit him back even harder, and then it was on. Yeah. And it was awesome. It, this reminded me, Rick Steiner was Ishii, and uh, Adams was, best I could do was Okada. Maybe that's another another comp, but Rick is just stone. <laughs> he just comes mm-hmm. and gets in there and starts clobbering Adams. Adam, Adams says, all right, fucker, hits him back. Great! <laughs> that you know was my awesome. favorite part of it was? Right when they had the moment where they both took turns hitting each other in the face as hard as they could, mm-hmm. Adams goes for the takedown and gets stuffed. And so, do you know what his very next move was? Try it again. Karate kick. Karate kick. If this wrestling ain't working, yes, I'm going to use karate. I'm smiling just thinking about this match. It was awesome. Mm-hmm. So eventually, Steiner hit a belly-to-belly and the diving bulldog for the win. Yeah. And these matches were very fun. Oh, yeah. And then it got even better. I don't know about that. Oh, oh I get do. out of here, Craig. <laughs> what is wrong with you? Disco Inferno hey, comes out. The 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 what's the opposite of an ovation? The biggest negative reaction to Oh yeah, they're booing the they shit out of this guy. He's the, like the, Roman this, Reigns. They needed to be in Cincinnati every week, I've decided. So Disco goes to the announce desk. He politely, kindly, nicely asks them, out of respect to him, please do not play the Conan music video that you play every week. He goes, they don't play a video for me. You play this video every week on every show. Mm-hmm. I'm sick of this video. Yeah. I'm asking you very nicely, stop playing this video. And he did. He did ask them nicely. Yep. And the announcer's like, well, fuck you, Disco. Yeah. We're going to play this video. Right. And he's pleading, please don't play the video. So they play the video. And it's Conan's music video, except Disco Inferno has cheaply and uh, poorly edited, him- edited himself into the video. Where he just stood in front of a green screen, green screen. They play a video, video behind him. He is dancing. He is mean mugging, and then he pulls out the lyrics on paper and does his very, very best to rap along. No, he had his own lyrics. Well, he changed. I think he changed one word. There were a couple of things that he but, changed. But the best part was he did this in one take because there were a few lines he fucked up. Yeah, but it didn't matter because he was supposed to. Sure. This was the best. This was hilarious. This is what's missing in wrestling today. Creativity like this. There's a lot of things where you go back, comedy skits, uh, where you go back, and when you, when you know where they're going, they're not nearly as funny, because that's how humor, how humor works. I knew exactly where this was going from the moment Disco came out and talked about this video. It was a hundred times better than I've remembered. Oh, it was beautiful. And they go back to the announcers, and Tony is trying so hard not to laugh. Yes. Well, kinda. But he is broken. See, I, he I, is broken. I actually went the other way. I think he was barely trying to keep a straight face. Larry and Tanae largely kept it together. Yeah. Tanae was struggling to put his stern face on. <laughs> I loved this. Disco was so proud I of his rib. I loved, loved, loved this. Oil of Olay. Oil of Olay. <laughs> that he stole from Kevin Nash from two weeks ago. It's much funnier when Disco Inferno does it. Yeah, maybe Kevin. I bet Kevin stole it from Disco. Yeah. Bet you anything Disco brought that up to him when he stole his line mm-hmm. on TV. Kevin Nash and Tori Wilson are watching Mrs. Robinson do her thing in David Flair's room. Oh, yeah, I love this. They got cameras in the room. Mm-hmm. The NWO does. Like nine of them. Yeah. It's not just like <laughs> one camera that's like hidden behind a plant. No. There's like a camera up high. There's a camera down low. There's a camera shooting at their bed. I'm like, there's a camera shooting at, Hello? at, at the bed at an angle where they knew exactly where David Flair would be sitting and oh, exactly yeah. where Mrs. Robinson would put her leg. Yep. So she's putting the moves on him. David says, I can't, I'm in love with another woman. This gives Nash and Tori a hearty laugh. And then Well, Nash. Tori laughed too. Well, well she, she did, was, she but was she was smitten. smitten. Uh, I see, yeah. Yes. That, that, you're right. Yeah. So the closing shot is, yes, they, they've, they've taken this joke as far as it can go. We may as well go all the way. They actually recreated. I've never seen the, uh, the graduate. Well, I bet it was but, better than this. Yeah. But I've seen this picture. And the older woman puts up her leg in the bed and the younger man's in the background and asks, are you trying to seduce me? Well, it was David saying, are you trying to seduce me, Mrs. Robinson? And the answer is no, because no one would ever want to seduce David Flair. But I think you are. The door is right over there. 
So eventually David kicks her out. And first, Nash and Tori are having a funny laugh at this, how, how badly this plan went. And they're flirting back and forth. But then Nash's mood kind of changes when he realizes, wait a minute, that was our plan. It didn't work. Now we need a new plan. He blames Tori for this, reminds her that her deal is with him, nobody else, and he's still in charge. And she agrees. I just... <sighs> so fucking dumb. Nash goes, this is a shitty plan. She goes, well, what's your plan? He says... Well, I don't know, but the point of this is, the old man has our belt. Ric Flair. Mm. Tori says, let's get it back. Can't be that hard. <laughs> and Nash goes, it's not about that. I don't know. And I'm like, wait, you just said the big problem know. is the old man has the belt. This storyline sucks. It does. I mean, the whole point of getting another girl was because Rick didn't care about David and Tori. I, 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 you know what? I have no idea what's going on. Yeah, it sucks is what's going on. <laughs> I don't care. Went on forever and was awkward. So, speaking of things that go on forever, Norman Smiley tried to teach Ricky Rackman how to dance. I got bored. <laughs> I looked up what Ricky Rackman is up to these days. Oh, yeah. He's still doing TV and radio. Mm -hmm. uh, the most shocking thing is that, I'm not making this up, apparently he and Adam Curry are still fighting for the same jobs. That's right. It's 2018. Yeah. How can that be? Well, some things never change. Like the same two people have followed the exact same career path for 30 years now? Well, who's going to diverge? I, I'm pretty sure Adam Curry has a uh, show. What else is Ricky sexy. Rackman going to do? I, I figured one of them do something. I don't know. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Picks of Flair and Hogan in the barbed wire cage match, and Arn Anderson taking out David Flair, passing a tire iron to Rick. So Rick Flair arrives. He is in a limousine with Arn Anderson and four good-looking women. Remember our uh, conversation earlier about hamburger and steak? Yes. Ric Flair is there with four pretty women I'll and say. says to one of them, you know, my wife doesn't like me hanging out with you. You don't say. Yeah. <laughs> How strange. <clears throat> they invite Charles Robinson to walk out with them. They all go get interviewed by Gene. So Charles says everyone in WCW owes a, owes a debt of gratitude to Ric Flair, but that did not influence his decision in this match. He said Ric Flair's wounds were superficial. Hogan was badly hurt in a beaten man. And he implied he had stopped the match to protect Hogan. That's why, what I got out of it. Hey, Hogan was unconscious in a figure four. His, nice. his leg could have been destroyed. Mm. Charles made the right call. So Flair is ranting about being the most powerful man in the business because he is, in fact, president for life now. As, in, in, in addition to being world champion. Is it Flair that goes crazy and decides he's the president of the U.S.? Or did he do that a few years ago? I have no idea. Hogan was running I seem to recall that happening. So Goldberg comes out. Says, the last time I was in the ring with Flair, I had you begging for mercy. I want a title shot tonight. Out comes Nash. People are just going hog wild. They're this. going crazy for this it's segment. Insane. Nash says, hey, wait a minute. I should be top contender. I was like, you were champion three months ago, and you gave it up. Why do you care now? I don't understand. So they're all going back and forth. Goldberg's threatening R, and out comes Hogan. Calls Goldberg Old Baldy. Old Baldy. Can you imagine? <laughs> he said Flair was bleeding and pinned the night before. As far as he was concerned, he was still champ. So the NWO challenges Flair and Goldberg to a tag match. Flair gets in Goldberg's face. Goldberg shoves him down, but agrees to the match. And Flair finally agrees, and so there you go. That's the main event. This segment was like the Goldberg matches of promos. It was like a little wild, a little out of control. It felt real. Yes. It definitely wasn't scripted. People were, like, forgetting their lines and what they were supposed to say, and then Flair jumped in after they were already playing the music to confirm that he was going to have the match. I loved it. It was As funny. did the fans. It was funny, because at, at the very end, when Flair, Flair finally confirmed the match, but the music was playing, it felt like the segment was over, and you had Hogan agreeing to the match, Nash agreeing to the match, Goldberg agreeing to the match. Ric Flair had not yet agreed to the match. The only guy who had not agreed was President. The one guy you would, yeah. think would have to agree. And, I mean, the one thing that wasn't good about it is... Flair is the president. He showed up with four hot women. He wasn't going to wrestle. He was going to go downtown because mm -hmm. he can because he's the president. Sure. Goldberg shoved him on his ass when he asked Goldberg, you want to be my partner? And then he's like, all right, let's do the match. Flair's crazy. Well. <laughs> it's the best I can do. You know, you're right. 
Vincent and Horace blamed each other for uh, Vincent losing to Stevie Ray. I'm over this storyline. They both said they were in charge of the black and white, and they just went their separate ways. Shit. Ray Mysterio Jr. versus Kidman. This was a great match. What this was, I'm going to use the word Brian used talking about the Okada match last week. This match was smooth. Oh, yeah. Everything looked like perfect 10 execution. It was awesome. And he was crazy for all the high spots. He was crazy. Because they're cruiserweights. Because the cruiserweights. Fans like to see him fly. Looks cool. Tony and Larry had what I thought was a hysterical argument about whether or not you could do a takeover on a guy who was already down. (laughs) You can. you, You agree with Tony then? Yeah. Larry didn't think you could do a takeover on a guy who's already down. Larry was confusing a takeover with a takedown. I see. But it it was funny. So fans are into all these dozens of near falls. Kidman keeps going for the shooting star press, and he can't get it. Finally, he goes up in the corner, and Ray is up there. And they've already done this spot where Kidman's up top, and Ray does like the spinning Rana. And Ray tries it this time, but Kidman counters that. But Kid, uh, Ray counters the counter, hits his enormous bulldog off the top rope, and pins him to win the Cruiserweight title. A forgotten classic on Nitro. Yeah. It's very good. They had a lot of really cool spots. Uh, one, uh, Ray was running off the apron to do her Conrana, but Kidman drop kicked him out of the out of the air, which is beautiful. There then was they oh. did hit a, he did hit a Rana and they went to commercial. I was like, wow, this is like watching Raw. Yeah, that's true. There was a conversation on the board uh, a few weeks ago about uh spots you hate, just in general. And one of mine was the guy comes off the top rope and gets drop kicked. And I hate it because it usually looks terrible. They did it here, it looked awesome. Mm-hmm. So good for them. One thing I didn't like about this match, the only thing I didn't like is they have this match. They go back and forth. They're kicking out of all these near falls. It's a very modern match. And then Ray pins a guy. And then they get on their feet, they smile, and they hug each other and raise each other's hands. Yeah. Kidman I'm was, like, Kidman, fucker, you just lost the belt. <laughs> Kidman was ecstatic. About Hello? How, he, he lost a good match. I was mad because... He had a moment. He had, they he had were more excited moment. about their performance yes. than the championship. Well, Kidman especially. Well, yeah. I, I agree with you. I'm it's dumb. It was. This is the Cruiserweight Championship of the fucking planet Earth here. I can only assume that Kidman was just caught up in the moment. and Because this crowd was awesome. Yeah. It was a great match. They got a great ovation. He may have been near tears. Stevie Ray confronted Horace. Oh, God. They both said they were in charge of the black and white. Can I, can I do the dialogue? <laughs> Disco shows up. And Stevie says, Disco, you tell Hogan. That if Hogan is blowing smoke up my chimney, I don't like that. And I'm Stevie Ray. And then Horace says... So happy you did this. Horace says, I want that turkey in the ring tonight. He... I I want that... And he's trying to think of a word (laughs) that he can say on TNT. Say MF or no. Uh, Turkey. The other great thing is the way Stevie just sucker punched Horace before Disco even showed up. Yeah, just punched him and walked out. <laughs> Which Horace totally no sold when Stevie was gone. Doesn't like Hogan blowing smoke up his chimney. No. Where is your chimney? Where's my chimney? Yeah. Downstairs. Downstairs. Yeah. I don't think that's your chimney. Chris Benoit and Dean Malenko came out for a promo. I wouldn't want Hogan blowing in either chimneys. Fair enough. So they're tag team champions now, Benoit and Malenko are. They cut a boring promo. About how this was the result of teamwork and a team victory. We challenge any team to face us tonight. They're trying. Are they? Well, yeah, well I mean, they're like, you know, this place sucks, but we're the tag team <laughs> champions, so let's they are gone and have some goddamn tag months, team matches yeah. here. So the tag title match, as we suspected, was in fact Lumberjacks with straps. Now, you had to buy the show to find this out, mm-hmm. but that's what it ended up being. So the whipping ended up making sense in the long run. And Arn cheated to help the Horsemen win in this match, too. And then we have Benoit Malenko versus Hugh Morris and the Barbarian. The Barbarian traded in his Ming for a Hugh Morris. Yeah. Well, Ming left him. How the hell did Hugh Morris end up in charge of developmental? Yeah, right? Fucking sucks. They did a spot where, like, I can't even describe it. Barbarian is going to do a powerbomb onto Hugh Morris' knee... As Hugh Morris is kneeling. Yeah. Who the fuck came up with this stupid idea? He power bombs. He fucking power bombs this guy on a Hugh Morris's knee and almost breaks his leg. Like his knee collapses and he literally crumples in a heap. Yeah. And I'm like, somebody hired this man to head <laughs> WWE developmental. 
Did he ever have a good match? I have watched him, and my, my, my take on Hugh Morris is that he's always the guy who had so much going for him and did nothing with it. Well, he was an athletic guy. He's huge. Yeah. Very athletic. He had charisma. He was not just a guy. He was not horrible. No. But he was not But his good. matches were. <laughs> like, I mean, if you want a developmental territory where you make a guys who aren't terrible, then great. <laughs> I want a little more than that if it's my company. Not to mention you want a uh, developmental where guys make the most of their gifts. Sure, Hugh Morris yeah. is not that. So, long heat segment on Malenko. Benoit gets the hot tag, gets thrown outside. Jimmy Hart's working over Chris Benoit. Yeah, Jimmy Hart is I, working over Chris Benoit. I cannot suspend my disbelief. No, it's that, ridiculous. That so, Barbarian accidentally kicks Morris. Benoit has the diving headbutt for the win. That was that. I think it was better than we're making it sound. It was better than we're making it sound, but it was very long and it's kind of boring. Yeah. Scott Steiner and Buff Bagwell came out for a promo. And Scott blamed Buff for fumbling the ball last night, and that's why Booker T beat Scott for the TV title. So Buff's first tack is to point out that the fans like him more. There's more signs for him. He's in better shape. And they argued about that, and Buff said, look, this is, we're getting, this is getting out of hand. Let's shake hands and go back and talk about it like men. So they shake hands and they hug, but Steiner turns that hug into a belly-to-belly, whacks him with a chair, puts him in the Steiner recliner, threatens to break his neck again, and finally leaves him laying and goes to the back. So, yeah, Buff is apparently out of the NWO now, you would think. Glad they're not going to spring break together. Oh, that's right. That's a good thing, yeah. actually. Well, I build up to that, and the payoff is no. They actually had some pretty good dialogue. Mm-hmm. Like Steiner goes, Beg, will you get a pencil neck and hurt your neck? You're not the same anymore. You don't belong here. Bagwell points out that the crowd likes him more, and Steiner says, I don't give a shit about the crowd. Bagwell says, maybe you're jealous because I got back into shape. And Steiner said, I'll always look better than you. You'll always be second best next to me. Bagwell says, you're Big Papa Pump, but you're not buff and you're not the stuff. Like, every one of these lines the crowd is into. Oh, yeah. They're like, oh, he said he's not the stuff. I can't believe it. Steiner says, you were nothing before the NWO. If you get kicked out, you'll be nothing again. People go, oh. <laughs> and he belly bit to belly to bellies him and beats his ass, and the fans are chanting for Buff afterwards. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This was an awesome crowd. This was a great crowd. They should be here every week. They should move developmental here. Hugh Morris should have known that. <laughs> you ever been to Ohio? Actually, I think they were in Cincinnati. What am I talking about? I'm sorry, Rob, but even st- my father grew up there, and I was not a fan. Stevie Ray versus Horace. This, I was not a fan of this either. <laughs> so okay, this was fucking terrible. They're clobbering each other. They were. <laughs> they were barely touching each other. Mm-hmm. The crowd was dead. It fucking sucked. And then I it was, was a finish. <laughs> There's nothing more to say about this. All what right, the on, fuck do you want about Stevie Ray and a Horace? It was bad. I wrote too short to be awful. Stevie what? won. Go what in. are you talking about? It was too about? awful to be short. There's no such thing as too short to be awful, Vinny. All right. You of all people should know. Wait, what? <laughs> Conan versus Disco Inferno Crowd is chanting for the NWO in this match Well Conan first came out to speak on this As he does Yes He was very upset that Disco was trying to perpetrate his video Actually he was trying to perpetrate on his video And he wanted his buster ass out there Sounds lewd That's what he said I know what he said He didn't mention peeling his potatoes So it's not that lewd Then they had a match Went forever. Yeah, through a break. Went through a break. We got ten, 10 minutes plus a break, and the finish is Elizabeth takes the ref, Lex bonks Conan with his cast, Disco is the chart buster for the win. And by the way, Lex has the other arm wrapped this week, because last week it had a, he had a brace and a glove on the left arm. Yes. Yeah. This week, his right arm is all bandaged up. But this is one of these things I love about wrestling. So last week, he had the left arm taped up. This week, he had the right arm taped up. As I said. And we're supposed... He, like... He, I guess, is supposed to believe that he's fooling us. Mm-hmm. Okay? But he's got his cast over a long sleeve sweatshirt. <laughs> right. Because he's a fucking idiot. I loved it. Should also know that he's wearing this big-ass shirt because he looks like he's lost 30 pounds since he hurt his arm. Mm-hmm. Booker T versus Chris Jericho. Another long match. The crowd was tired by this point. The crowd was getting burned out. It was a three-hour show. So Booker hits an axe kick. I think Jericho was supposed to dodge. Because <laughs> Booker clunked him pretty good. And then the ref gets... Well, Booker goes for a drop kick. My guess is Booker just clunked him pretty good. 
<laughs> you really want to know. There's also that. Regardless, Jericho pulls the ref in the way to block a drop kick, and the ref gets up and disqualifies him, and that's that. This was a waste of time. And by the way, Jericho is not long for this company. I know, that's what I was thinking, too. He, he couldn't get pinned by the TV channel. Like, why can't Booker pin Jericho? I don't know. And it made me mad because, like, if you're going to do, I've mentioned this a million times, if you're going to do a shit finish, do like a four-minute match. Yes. Don't make me sit through through two commercial breaks in 18 minutes and then give me a shit finish. That makes me mad at the company. Yes. Yeah, Chris Jericho's got one foot out the door. With that said, I love it when heels act like buffoons. Yeah, yeah Lex Luger and his cast. Chris Jericho here in this match. Buffoons everywhere on this show. And then it was time for the main event. Kevin Nash in, and Hulk Hogan versus Ric Flair and Goldberg in one of the weirdest matches I can remember. Yeah, but it was great. It absolutely was. It was awesome. So, Fans loved every moment of it. So they they liked the NWO, they loved Goldberg, and they hated Flair. So whenever Flair was in the ring, the NWO was the babyfaces, and whenever Goldberg was in the ring, the NWO was the heels. When this match started, I thought, Ric Flair is going to bump for three men. Basically, he did. He did. He did. It started out because it's a tag team match, so one guy's got to start. Mm -hmm. And Flair goes, Goldberg, you start! And he, like, pokes him or whatever. So Goldberg, his partner, responds by picking him over his head and mm -hmm. press-slamming him. Right. Flair starts. <laughs> might makes right. I liked it. Yeah. That's right. Might, might makes right, Vinny. So, so Flair starts. He gets his ass kicked. He is a bumbling buffoon. Yep. Eventually, Goldberg comes in. He runs wild because he's Goldberg, but they cut him off and get the heat on him. And he would cut them off and not tag Flair in. So Flair is pissed. When the ref's back is turned, Flair does the slap hands gimmick to fake a tag. And he gets in the ring, and Goldberg just leaves. And then Flair goes after Hogan. But Hogan, who has been winning for five minutes, makes a comeback. <laughs> I don't know what he was coming back from. So they do some stuff for two or three minutes. And... This match was a wild mare. Yeah. Yeah. So Hogan hits the big boot. He wants to do the leg drop, but Goldberg and Nash are in the way. So he has to wait for them to leave. He hits the leg drop, makes a pin. Charles Robinson won't count. Yeah. So Hogan punches him. Robinson takes a fantastic bump. Then Goldberg spears Hogan. Huge ovation. The show goes off the air. Yeah. No finish. No finish. No finish. There's hey, you know theme. what? Is no finish worse than the NWO running in? At least it's a different shit finish. At least this one, it makes sense because the ref was laid out. So sure. there's no one to call for the bell. And it was satisfying because Goldberg speared Hogan right when the show ended. Also true. Yeah. So and we can add that when the show went off the air, there was a little picture on the screen for next week's Impact, and it is, in fact, at Club Lavella. Mm -hmm. Oh, your favorite. The best Nitro of the year every year. Yeah. You can't screw up a show with a ring in a swimming pool. Somebody's going in the drink. It's impossible. Why is, has anyone stolen that gimmick since Nitro went no, under? No, I don't know what's wrong with people. Hmm. Well, Jericho did. He's on a boat. That doesn't count. It's kind of the same thing. You can't thing. throw people into the ocean. You well, can. you can. I'm pretty sure it's illegal. It's a work, Craig. I don't know. <laughs> You're right. You can, <laughs> I, mean, I was listening. I want to make this clear. Did you not don't watch throw Raw? Off a boat. It's a stunt. Understood, Brian. It's a, it's a uh, what did they call it? A publicity stunt. It's a publicity stunt. Hey, play Vinny's music, will you? Oh, yeah. What do we use? Actually, uh, the first half of this was so dull, I thought about canceling it this week, but things turned around. All right, here we go. The finishes on this show were clean pin, clean pin, clean pin, clean pin. Pin after bonking into a chair and with a tight held. Pin after interference. Lame DQ for pulling the ref in the way. And no finish in the main event. The Observer said this week Eric Bischoff had returned from France and seemed disinterested at this show. <laughs> huh. I'm like, good. Go back to fucking France again. This will explain why they just had awesome. a bunch of wrestling matches. Yeah, this was great. great. We are at war! Then it's off a, off a cliff. Monday Night Show, number 184, March 22nd, 1999. I'm going to let you go for just like a second before I really unleash on this show. Because I'm fixing to. Get a good running start. Yeah, just go for a little while, then I'm going to get in there. So they showed clips from Uncensored, which is two weeks ago now. Of Chastity turning on her brother Raven to help hack win a three-way that also included Bam Bam Bigelow. So it's spring break. It's a bunch of 
young people who've been stressing out about school, going to the beach to break loose, and you go to Club Lavella, and you are rewarded with Bull Payne versus Van Hammer. Here How goes. the fuck hard is this? How many fucking nitros in a row have we watched as they steadily decline where the goddamn show opens with a shitty match? Go, Brian. Is this that hard? Go. Not only that, not only that, not only do we start with a fucking terrible match here on Mm -hmm. the show, but... Preach. There was a boring chant six minutes and ten seconds into the show. Dude, there were boring... Oh, into the show. I thought you could see the end of the match. That has to be a fucking record. They were boring chance 20 seconds into the match. A wrestling show at, I might add, Club Lavella. Mm-hmm. Six minutes and 10 seconds into the show, the fans were chanting boring. Yeah. You know what the greatest part of this is? I'm not quite done, but I, I, go ahead. If I may. Go ahead. They're running unopposed. Yes. There's um, nothing on the other channel. There's no other wrestling on yes. right now. Yes. And this is what they present. Yes, because they're fucking morons. Because they thought, we're unopposed, and so people are just going to watch whatever. Wrong. Nothing to hook them, hook them in for three hours. Not only that, like, if you go to a Nitro show in Atlanta, GA, or the Carolinas, you got a bunch of wrestling fans showing up. Fine. Give them Hammer versus Bullpain. They just want to see some fucking wrestling. This is Club Lavella in front of, as Vinny noted, not wrestling fans. You can't trot out like one fucking star to open up the show. And Van Hammer. That's a star. And it's not even like it was two nobodies having a good match. No. This match fucking sucked. Now, I will say, there were two stars later in the show that had a way worse match than this. It's true. So maybe I'm wrong, but this was far below the level of indies that we worked on in 1999. (laughs) It would have been fucking disgraceful on an indie show today. Yes. And here it was opening up a national wrestling television show. And it went forever. It did go forever. I didn't even need to write a book. There's no mystery here why they went out of business. It really writes itself. Just watch the fucking TV show. It's patently obvious. They did everything wrong. Go ahead. Talk about this shitty match. So had I been one of those students stressing out about college and going to the beach to relax and they trot out Van Hammer and Bull Payne, I'd have immediately left and gone back to school. Back to the dorms. You wouldn't have gone back there to hang out with Jim Ross. Well, we'll get to Jim Ross in the college party. So, yes, uh, aside from when they began to tease each other, tease me into the pool, everything about this sucked, and it got no reaction, two big clumsy oaf, oafs lumbering around, bucking into each other, and then, as I wrote here, Hammer won with some kind of move. Well, he, first he did the, uh, whatever he called it. He did it. a Cobra, 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 clutch, cobra slam. clutch Slam. And then they said, and, and like, he starts doing something like he's, I don't know. Plotting? Messing with acid. Is that what it is? Yeah, he's got these little papers. Putting it on his tongue? He's doing something. He's like going, ah. He's rolling papers like he's going to smoke a J. Whatever the fuck. No, because the finishing move is called the flashback. Yes. So I guarantee this was something to do with psychedelics that he was doing. I don't do any, never. but I do know. If you do, we do have cameras. From You've when never I w- smoked weed, have you? From what, No, I haven't. From when I was a child. I haven't either. When I was a child, they used to have the stories of LSD on lick and stick tattoos. So I know that, like, licking is involved. So so you, what you know about acid, you learned from Dare to Keep Kids Off Drugs. Basically, yeah. Okay. And it was a bullshit story on top of that. Anyway. <laughs> it's just a little stick of paper you put on your tongue and it dissolves. He hits the That's fucking flashback <laughs> after going like this or whatever. Which sounds <laughs> more fun than I realized. And then he hits the fucking worst Alabama slam. How can you not do an Alabama slam? Are you slam? sure that's what it was? No. Yeah, he put the guy over his shoulder and he just slammed him. That's the flash. Yeah, but an Alabama slam doesn't go over your shoulder. It's... I know. Yeah. He sucks. He sucks bad. This match was terrible. I didn't like down. it. I'm ready for a new show now. <laughs> Already? <laughs> Clips of Rey Mysterio and Kidman from last week. And then Ricky Rackman interviewed Rey Mysterio. I hope you're all big fans of Ricky Rackman because he's all over the show. So he's out there. Yeah, and then he's, they... He's... Cock block us. He's Carson Daly with tattoos is what he later. is. He's just this TV dweeb out there. And here's Ray, no mask, looks nine years old. He got his dad's baseball shirt on and a beanie. Mm-hmm. They have made him look like a bigger dork. 
He's Ricky Rackman's towering over him. It's Ricky Rackman. What are you gonna get? Like a little person? Who don't the fuck's put a, gonna interview Ray that doesn't tower over him? Don't make it so obvious. Somehow. <laughs> How? Have him in the pool? I'm sure. Putting the mic out like this while Ray's on land. Something. What the fuck do you want to do? He's 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 tiny. Well, I, I don't want Ricky Rackman on TV at all. So yes, Ray is a tiny, tiny person. He talks about partying all week and says he will give Kimmin another shot of the title at Spring Stampede. Ray was at the old cutoff line for minis. Yeah. So, like, you're not going to find a shorter announcer. Clips of the Miss Nitro contest. You know, lots of young women in bikinis at the beach. Historically proven to be a ratings winner. Except it wasn't, because it's WCW. Yeah. Ricky Rackman's back. And you're hearing Disco Inferno. Ricky Rackman accused Disco Inferno of being unfunny. Yeah. Pot kettle. Well, it's untrue as well. Yeah. Not just pot kettle, but it's factually incorrect. Disco, I'm paraphrasing, but Disco said, I'm going to steal a Yakov Smirnoff joke. He delivered a Yakov Smirnoff joke. It was funnier than Ricky Rackman. Yeah. Play this video again. Play this video again. It's still awesome. It is. Craig. I watched it again. Yeah. Yeah, it's just as good the second time. And you're right. He was trying to actually read the lyrics, except for Oil of Olay. Yeah, that's the only one he changed. But and he actually great. gets through like two verses, but then on the third verse, he's just out of here. He's he's lost. There's a point where he gets to the end of a verse. It's the first or second one, but he finishes the line, and clearly they did this all in one take, and he did no rehearsing. Because he, he reads the words, trying to fit it to the rhythm as best he can, and then he realizes he has no idea what he has just said. He just looks up at somebody and shrugs. Like, what, yeah, what that's what made show? it awesome. Yes. That's the comedy video. It is. And he challenges Conan to a match at Spring Stampede. Yes. Tony Schiavone tried to read the sponsor copy. But... And by the way, Craig. Yeah. I guarantee you that the video is going to be better than the Conan Disco Inferno match at Spring Stampede. That I will agree with. And we were there. Yeah, we were. Tony Schiavone tries to read the sponsor copy, but first he's complaining the graphics aren't on screen. And then the graphics finally come up on screen, and then he decides, for no reason, I will read these in the Lee Marshall impression voice. Sure, why not? You don't care. Clearly. Everybody has given up. He cannot possibly have been sober here. <laughs> Recap of Scott Steiner turning on Buff Bagwell last week, and then realize that in the fuck was it? <laughs> realize they have three hours to kill. But here's thirty seconds. Fit Finley goes to Rick Steiner's trailer. He says, "Is Rick here?" And Rick's assistant Ray or whatever says, "Yes." And Rick appears. He's got a beer. And Finley says, "Okay, I wanted to make sure you were here. We have a match later." Rick says, "Yep. See you out there." I know That's it. I know it's not what you make. It's what you save. Was it supposed to be like his house or just like his trailer on the lot? I assume his trailer on the lot. Okay. You thought this was the, the Steiner? I don't know. I could not figure out what the fuck was going on. I thought he went to his house. <laughs> like, what are you going to his house for to challenge him to a match at Club La Vella? Okay, that's funnier. I wish it had been his house. That's what I was thinking it was. I was like, this guy's got to be like a multi, 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 multi millionaire today. Living in a trailer during his <laughs> big money making years. Yeah. If that's, like the case, Hardy. if that's the case, he should have gone out to check his mail and then bumped into Finley there. Should have. That would have been better. Recap of the Flair, Goldberg, Nash, Hogan, Kerfluffle from last week. And then, swear to God, Ricky Rackman was back. This show was not a half hour old. His third appearance. So he's narrating clips of Goldberg doing an appearance at a NASCAR race when Hack interrupts. He demands to be referred to as Hack, Hardcore Hack, the King of Extreme. He called out Goldberg, whacked himself with a stick to prove how hardcore he was. Then he left, and Ricky just kept on talking about how great Goldberg is. We know, Ricky. We've been watching. He was wrapped in fake barbed wire, smacked himself in the head with the kendo stick, and made himself bleed. Yeah. Because he's wacky. It was at this point that I wrote, can we get a fucking exciting match, please? And we almost did. I, I would we say had a we video did. package first. Well, a video pack, a, a Goldberg hype video. Nothing wrong with this. It just occurred to me they're pushing Goldberg harder now than it, than they did when he was world champion. I just want to remind everybody, we had a clip of Raven Bigelow hack. We had a horrible match. We had a rape promo, beat shots, a disco promo, a disco video, Fit Finley going to Rick Steiner's house, another flair video, an interview with Hack and Chastity, and 60 seconds with Goldberg. That happened. And then, a lucha match. Yes, Brian, I know it's awful. You're right. I understand the shock, but... <laughs> We got to move on or whenever we get it through. I can't. We had La Parca and Damien and Super Kolo and Liz, Ma Liz Mark Jr. versus Psychosis, El Dandy, Silver King, and somebody in a Mill Maskers match mask. 
He had and that, a flannel and baggy and flat flan- and, and plaid flannel pants, pajama pants, and pajama pants. And they they said they didn't know who it was, but it couldn't be Mil Masqueris because he wasn't sucking in his gut or dancing on his tiptoes. Sure, that made me laugh. They finally said this is La Cucaracha. La Cucaracha, yeah. the cockroach. Yes, thank you, Craig. <laughs> you are so learned. Well, I knew Brian didn't know it because he's Mexican. Right, get out of here. So. So the story of the Cucaracha in this match is he gets in there once in a while, he gets his ass kicked on some very simple stuff, and he tags right back out. So essentially, you had seven luchadors taking turns doing their thing. It was fun. Mm-hmm. They had a fun lucha match. It was fun, but first off, they're on a floating ring. Yeah. And the railing is so goddamn close to the yes, ring apron. Yes, that's true. It's like, it's not even, it's probably like three feet that they have to work with. And these fucking luchadors are doing dives into this tiny little area. I don't know how in, none of them fell into the water. They they do this giant train wreck spot to the outside where they all do a dive. They all miss a move off the top rope, crash and burn. Nobody cares. It's deadly silent. And then La Cucaracha suddenly hits a bunch of stunners mm-hmm. and wins. Stone Cold <laughs> is here at Club La Vela. Amazing. Now, I had a I had a thought during this match. Since the platform is on water and the ring is on the platform, is it better taking bumps in this ring than in one that's on the concrete floor? Should be. What? Well, the water has give. Yeah. So why the fuck would it be worse? No, not worse, better. Well, the answer is yes, Craig. Why wouldn't it be? I don't know. I just thought about it. Huh. huh. Wow. Okay. Okay. So yes, the cucaracha turns to the camera and says, No comprende! In all my years covering Club Lavella, had never entered my mind. I bet you it's a joy to work in that ring. Hmm. We had more spring break Did clips. you watch the show? It was not a joy to work in this ring on this <laughs> no, night. No, it was a joy to w- watch what was going on in the ring. Then we had a backstage skit. This is awesome. Which, I'll, I'll cut to the chase. This is Lucha Underground. Where By we, the way, it's disco, everybody. Well, yeah. yeah. I couldn't figure it out already. Yeah. It was not Stone Cold Steve Austin. Nor Mil Maskers. No. no. Nor Luca Caracha. So this is one of those skits where we, the viewers at home, see it, but nobody on the show actually sees it. So JJ and Flair are in the parking lot outside Club Lavella, talking about spring break and, of course, the women. And Flair says, look, I'm the president. I cannot just take myself off the show. So here's what I'm going to do. He says, I'm so excited. There's these hot college girls everywhere. I owe it to these girls mm-hmm. to wrestle here on this show. That's right. That's right. So his plan is, he says, I'll go out there. I'll challenge everyone on the roster. But we'll draw a name out of a hat. But you just fill that name with mid-card and below, he says. Mid-card and cruiserweights. Luchadors and cruiserweights, yes. Just burying everyone. And the plan is, he wants to get this match over with as quickly as possible. Put on the appearance of uh, you know challenging anyone in the company. Get it done and go out and get laid. Yeah. Yeah. So really any other night for Ric Flair when I think Sure, about yeah, basically. Okay. What was this Mike Tanay interview with Dusty Rhodes? Allow me. <laughs> Mike Tanay is on the beach with Dusty Rhodes. Or a whale. Dusty A whale would have been more coherent. Rambles on and I'll give him this. A very charismatic manner. He's first off. Mike's trying to ask him some questions about what's going on in WCW. I don't even know, like, he's a commissioner now or something. I don't even know why. He goes, I'm very upset that Larry has taken my spot at the commentary booth. I am much better doing commentary than Larry. Today tries to steer him back to talking about Ric Flair. Dusty says, you know, I'd be better than you as well, Mike Tanay. Mike tries to steer him back to Ric Flair. Dusty says, well, Ric Flair is the president. And I have to say that you caught me off guard with these questions. He starts talking about how great he is again. And he says, Ric Flair, are you cross with me? Are you... I can't even do it. Craig? Are you cross if if you... Are you cross with me? And then he announces that he's still the bull of the woods. Still the bull of the woods. What? wheel. Is he coming back for a match with Ric Flair in 1999? That's no. I don't remember this. You got more out of this than I did. What was this? I don't know. He spent the entire... He hasn't been on TV and I don't even know how long. 
months. It's a good six months. He's on here thinking it's 1987 Crockett again. He just shows up out of nowhere, talks about how great he is. He's the top guy in this company. He's mm-hmm. a bull of the woods still. He'll beat up Ric Flair at any time. It's all, he's the best commentator. He's the best at everything. What? I think somewhere here he even said he was also the best referee. Drafted match between Barry Windham and Dean Malenko, as I understand. What he did. was this? I have no idea. Now, on top of that, he finishes. That's all I can say is he finishes. So then Mean Gene brings Flair out to the ring for a promo, but as Flair's making his entrance, the announcer's like, what the hell was Dusty talking about? <laughs> Larry is angry because he was insulted by Dusty. Tanay just says, he never actually answered my question. You don't say. Yeah. So Flair's out there to talk. Raven interrupts Ric Flair. What? Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. The guy who went shopping at the mall bought some really, really nice clothes and then never wore them again. He's just the same guy. <laughs> well, they dropped that angle because they didn't like it. What? <laughs> Great. That was awesome. Yeah. Great. So he says, I have never had a world championship match. Vinny, let's do a recap here. You be Raven, I'll be Flair. I'm in the ring, by the way. This is always fun. I'll do my best. I have never had a world championship match. Is he talking to me? Yeah. <laughs> Flair buries this guy. <laughs> yeah. Says, fine. You want a championship match, you can wrestle the world tag team champions, Ben Juan Malenko. Canyon's your partner. And Raven says, wait, Canyon's out making a movie, movie with Jesse Ventura. Well, all right, you're wrestling by yourself then against these two men. Yeah. Raven says, all right, I'll beat them both up. And he leaves. Because Raven's now the big, tough babyface guy. Thespians, both of you. Thank you. I only wanted the first part about is he talking to me. The rest, I was just not ready for. I, see. I was like Dusty. I wasn't ready for this. Yeah. And I love that Gene, Raven wants a match with Ric Flair. Ric Flair says, you can have Benoit Malenko in a two-on-one match instead. Mm-hmm. Gene goes, sounds like a great opportunity. <laughs> How so? <laughs> He's sucking up to the boss. So there you go. So, yes, and then Flair announces his plans. His lottery. His lottery. When he chooses his opponent at random, and the announcers had no idea this drawing was going to be rigged. Rick Steiner versus Fit Finley. Fun, mean guy match. There we go. The best thing I said, or the most accurate thing I can say about this is actually something Tony Schiavone said when he simply explained, this is pro wrestling in its purest form. Yeah. Fact. It is two big, tough, scary mofos getting into a ring, and wailing on each other. That's it. There was not really any story to this. There was not a long heat segment. There was not a comeback. There wasn't really a heel or a babyface or a villain or a hero. It was just two monsters committing carnage and violence. Thumbs up! Two guys, kind of in slow motion, punching each other. It wasn't even, like, it wasn't a great match. No. It was pure. This is the purest form of pro wrestling. Rick hit a DDT in the diving bulldog and won. Great. Yeah, it was good. Best thing on the show. Probably. El Vampiro versus Juventud Guerrera. This was not the best thing on the show. You know, I'm pretty sure. Let's see. I've known Dave since 1998, I believe. 20 years. Yeah. In 20 years, I don't think there is one thing that Dave and I disagree on more than the quality of wrestler of Juventud Guerrera. (laughs) In The Observer, like two weeks prior to this, he wrote that Juventud Guerrero is one of the best wrestlers in the entire world. What? Eh. Yeah. Excuse me? No, it's, yeah. Oh, it's, I where, thought you were agreeing with him. Where, no. Where's this, Dave at on Vampiro? This goddamn match was so... This was the worst match. Yeah. Actually, there was a match on Raw that was worse. But this was the worst match on this show. Yeah. One of the worst matches of all of 1999. They fucked up every single spot they tried. We got a boring chant again. Hoovy at one point just went for something and just missed. Yeah. Ac- Let's yes. go to detail. <laughs> he goes for a springboard something or other. Vampiro moves out of the way, but Hoovy wasn't expecting it. So Hoovy lands on his ass, then jumps up and just hits a Michinoku driver anyway. Yeah. And that was yes. finish. Yeah. You needed the finish, yeah. Listen, I know that some people are going to listen to this and go, well, Brian, it's clearly Vampiro's fault. Vampiro was not good here. He was, he was also terrible. Yes. But, but listen to me. If you, this would have been Vampiro versus AJ Styles, this would have been a thousand times better. 
if this were Vampiro versus Okada, it would have been a thousand times better. You don't say. Vampiro versus Naito, Okada's a thousand a times better. better. Wrestler than someone? Huh. My point is, if he were actually in there with one of the best wrestlers in the world, it yeah. would not have been this bad. Right. And Hoovy consistently has matches this bad. Every now and then, he does have a very good match. But he's in there with, like, Ray or something. Yeah, this just is... It's it, He was horrible here. Both guys were horrible. They were both terrible. Yeah. This match was hideous. Hoovy was not one of the best wrestlers of the world this night. That is true. So Vampiro did, like, 19 power bombs. Match went a very, very long time. They tried a top rope power bomb. They fucked it up. Thankfully, nobody died. And then Hoovy just hit another Mitch Noku driver and won. Sloppy, random, and very, very bad, I wrote. Hey, Ricky Rackman's back. <laughs> it is time for... Uh, he's All right, let's just get into what happens. He's walking out. He says, you know, I don't know much about professional wrestling. I was going to hire a guy yeah. who goes on record as saying he has no idea what he's talking about. He is there to present the winner of the Miss Nitro pageant. Now, I do not often transcribe things word for word, but I wrote down every single bit of their interview together. Her name is Julie Williams. Yes, it was. She comes out in baggy jeans and like a tank top. They begin the promo. Cute blonde, by the way. She's a very lovely, very lovely young lady. No doubt, about, no doubt about that. Ricky starts the promo with their backs to the hard camera. The announcers are openly burying him. Finally, he gets... Well, <laughs> Somebody turned him around. I will go from the start here. Say hello. Hi. Then they turn to face the hard cam. Say hello. Hello. What school are you here from? Chipotle Junior College. They have a college? Apparently. <laughs> and you're pretty excited that you are now Miss Nitro? Yeah. What does it mean to you to be Miss Nitro? It is cool. That was it. That was the whole promo. Well, he didn't get his other line, which I didn't write down, but basically, the NWO music starts playing, and mm -hmm. Ricky starts going on this thing going, you know, now that wherever you go in this country, <laughs> anywhere in the United States, you can call yourself Miss Nitro. And get Mexican food. Get out of here, Craig. So, Should have known this would turn to food. So, Chipotle. this was the blind leading the blind. So out come Hulk Hogan, Kevin Nash, and seven strippers. Very they were strippers. Oh, Craig. Craig, I've these were not college girls. Been to a gentleman's. Well, I, I, I'm sure they're professionals at what they did. Oh, I don't know if they were necessarily supposed to be college girls. They were models. Maybe they were working their what way you, through college. What do you go to spring break for? To get to blow off steam from college. They should have been looking for college girls. They went to a gentleman's club and got all seven or eight girls. I'm disgusted. As I was going to say, I, I have been to a gentleman's club a time or two in my life and dropped a lot of money in those clubs, and I did not drop that money on women who look like this. That's I, on you, brother. I think they're too hot to be strippers is what I'm saying. You sure you went to a strip club and not like a dive bar? Yes. Hmm. What state was this in? Uh, Washington and Nevada. Hmm. Yeah. Although it was that Colombian in Nevada. That was cool. Anyway. Colombian? Yeah. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> Can we get on with this? So... There's these beautiful, beautiful women out there with Hogan and Nash. They're kind of buckled. Excuse me? They were kind of buckled. Buckled? Buckled. I don't understand this term. Haggard. Oh, they were not haggard. Get oh, out of here, Craig. Go back and look at them. Oh, my God. So, anyway, there's seven of them. Fans chant, show your tits. Nash says it's too cold. I won't do that. Yes. He that says, was the funniest thing Nash has ever said. I thought there's eight girls. There's only seven. Let's bring out the eighth girl. Of course, it's Tori Wilson. The Winner. highlight of which is she gets her heels stuck in a grate. Yes. And instead of taking her shoes off, she's got to be in high heels, so it takes him like a good 30 seconds to get her fucking foot out of the thing. Gets in the ring, strips down. Nash wants Ricky to announce she's the winner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know why Nash can't just announce that she's the winner. He's, he's in a, the NWO. He's it's a bully. his fucking contest. He wants to bully somebody. He goes, declare her the winner. And Ricky says, listen. He tried to... Reason with the man. I am here for the Miss Nitro contest, okay? I'm only being paid for this. Not your damn contest. Yeah. Nash boots him in the stomach and bends him over, and he's going to give him a power bomb. And I'm like, you know what, Nash? How about you power bomb him over the barricade into the yeah, water? Into the pool, yeah. Then I'll rewrite Death of WCW. 
I'll be a little more forgiving to you. <laughs> Instead, he threatens, but then doesn't. And Ricky chooses Tori. At which point, Nash, all the cred that he got for his previous line, throws it out the window by saying, Sable, eat your heart out. Ha 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 ha! And Hogan goes, did you just say that, brother? Like, you guys are idiots. You're fucking idiots. <laughs> this sucked. That's one NWO takeover that wasn't too bad, Mike Tenney notes. This is an amazing segment for a variety of reasons. Do you know reasons. how bad a show has to be where they have a Miss Nitro bikini contest in Club Lavella, and I'm fucking sick of it and want it to end? That's pretty bad. Jiminy Christmas. This fucking sucked. But what did not suck was what came next. Hack versus Goldberg. Everyone stop. Just spend 10 or 15 seconds imagining, if you will, a match between Bill Goldberg and the Sandman. You got it. This is exactly what you would expect. You and I mean that in every possible positive way. Do you want to know why? Cause... I have come to a conclusion after this show. All right. Not only does Goldberg belong in the Hall of Awesome mm -hmm. and the Hall of Fame, every Hall of Fame there is, I would go as far as to say that he was a perfect professional wrestler. How could you improve upon Goldberg? I don't know. You don't want to be a better worker. No. <laughs> he's, he's exactly as explosive. He's exactly as out of control, and, and he's a wild animal. Yes. He's the best. So, I guess this was a hardcore match, because Hack was using it a sure was. chair and a stick, and ref didn't care. And then Goldberg starts no-selling the stick, hits a spear and a jackhammer, and he wins. Well, Hack's big mistake was he began hit hitting him repeatedly with the stick. In the head. Yeah, and he hit him like five times in the head. Goldberg just fired up. <laughs> Hack tries to give him his his uh, side Russian leg sweep. White Russian, white leg, Russian sweep. leg sweep. But with the cane, the yep. white Russian leg yep. sweep. Yep. And Goldberg just fucking stands there. <laughs> Hack falls down. He like breaks the stick over his leg. He spears the shit out of him. The place just goes nuts. He jackhammers him and wins. And then he he gets he like grabs the top rope and he does this thing where he, he just kind of goes, ah! And his traps go up high, and this big like fucking thing of drool drops out of his mouth. Just this enormous. Mm -hmm. Like if you ever watch Finding Bigfoot, they've got a they, the very like every commercial. There's an animated Bigfoot, and you see the Bigfoot go ah, and there's like this big thing of drool. That is fucking exactly what Goldberg did here. That's where they got it. It's so great. This is the best thing on the show by far. Mean Gene brings Bret Hart out for a promo. This is pretty good. Bret notes he has been in the WCW for more than a year now and has not received a title shot. The WCW. Yep. Mm -hmm. First thing he did upon uh, entering the company was wipe the floor with Ric Flair. And now Ric Flair is champion. He's still can get a title shot. Pointed out he had never wrestled Hogan, even though they were the two biggest stars of all time. He'd fought Kevin Nash many times before. He could beat him again. You may be the pencil, he says, but I could be the eraser. Says Goldberg has no technical sk skills. Dared him to come face him one time. He could beat Goldberg in five minutes. He could only take this promo back. Mm, indeed. It was fine. I liked it. Horace Hogan versus Vincent. Dude, in what universe was this not the worst match on the show? Uh, <laughs> this one. You know what's funny is last week, Horace wrestled Stevie Ray, and some genius in the back goes, that wasn't too bad. Put him out there with Vincent. Dude, they got to do their story. They got to do their weird storyline with all the shittiest guys. But this was better than that Vampiro Hoovy match. Yes, inconceivable. It's amazing. Jiminy. By my, by my fucking... calculations, Rock and Mankind was going on on the other channel. Mm. I would rather watch that. Yeah, Vincent here was much better than usual. By which I mean he was clearly not the worst wrestler in the entire world. Yeah. Did a Japanese arm drag at one point of all things. So Stevie Ray comes out. And Horace and Vincent bonk heads, and Horace is leaning against the ropes, and Stevie goes to push Horace on top of Vincent, but Vincent cradles him for the pin instead. Technical wizard, Vincent. So Stevie attacks Vincent after the match. Brian Adams comes out and joins in. Adams and Stevie are having an argument, and Tony Schiavone notes, some sort of plan went awry here. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, it was called the booking. Mm -hmm. It's time to draw a number for, to find Flair's opponent. Oh, my God. So they got the tumbler in the ring, and the story is all of the wrestlers are around ringside to find out if they got the number. But there's only like eight wrestlers out there, and one of the announcers goes, is that everybody? <laughs> the other announcer goes, I don't think so. Seems like there's a lot of guys missing. 
Yeah. They don't know what's going on. Uh, 20 guys just didn't want to go out. So here's the most infuriating thing. JJ pulls out number 23. Mm-hmm. 23 is not Rey Mysterio. 23 is L fucking Dandy. That's right. But L Dandy has his arm in the sling. Mm-hmm. And so Ray, like a dick kind of, steals his number and goes, I'll take care of this. That's basically what happened, yeah. Okay, I could have an, an amputated arm. I still want that match with Ric Flair. Well. That right. was not very friendly of Ray. And I was upset because I would have liked to have seen Ric Flair versus L Dandy. <laughs> well, I bet that, that would have been awesome. There's that too. So Ray comes out there. Flair is distressed to see him. You're not supposed to be in there, he says, because his plan was all mid-carters. You're a champion. You're not in this thing. Yeah. But, says, hey, you're out here now. I dare you to walk out here again in a half hour. Well, I mean, he did say that, but mostly he and JJ wanted to pick another number, Mm -hmm. and Gene held them to it. He says, dude, you picked the ball. You got to stick to it. It's Gene Oakland's. He should be the commissioner. He's handling all the business here. Had a Benoit Malenko video package set to Bob Holly's theme song. And then we got Chris Benoit and Dean Malenko versus Raven. So they destroyed him, but he wouldn't submit. He is now plucky babyface Raven. So they beat him, and they beat him, and they beat him, and they beat him, and they beat him. Out comes Saturn to make the save. He's got the dress on, he's got makeup on, and first they're just confused about why he's there, but they tell him to leave, and then he fires up, and hey, for this 30 seconds or so he fired up, this was awesome. Suplexes everywhere, just whipping ass. Tony says, Saturn is now part of this match, I guess. <laughs> that is a fact. So he was part of the match. It's a regular tag team match now, and then they cut Saturn off, and they hit 7,000 moves in a row. How could Ben Juan Malenko matches be so fucking boring? It was incredibly boring. So about an hour in, Raven gets a hot tag and runs wild. Crowd wakes up. It's a four-way. Saturn hooks Benoit in the rings of Saturn, but then Raven and Malenko start fighting with the belts. The ref calls for the DQ, so there's no title change. This would have been so much better. So much better. And they just said, Raven, Kane's not here. Who's your partner? He says, Saturn steps up with volunteers, and they just do a tag match. You know, Vinny, I'm glad that you determined this was disqualification because they rang the bell. They did not explain what the finish was. Nobody there live had any idea what the finish was. Everybody thought that Raven or Saturn had submitted Benoit. Yeah. Not to mention Raven was the one that got the hot tag, so he wasn't even the legal man. No. Not to mention Raven and Saturn ended up with the tag titles. This sucked. Not as champions, but they ended up with them. Physical possession. Yes, it was very confusing. They uh, rematched later on Spring Stampede in Tacoma, Tacoma Washington. Mm. (laughs) Ryan, don't care. Clips from Thunder of Flair stripping Scott Hall of the U.S. title for just not showing up. That's, yeah. It's, uh, in storyline, that's the reason. So. Keep in mind that the whole legal battle with Flair and Eric Bischoff started when Ric Flair just didn't show up one day. Yeah. It's kind of ironic. Yeah. So they're doing a title for the U.S. tournament, or the U.S. title. A tournament for the U.S. title. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And in the first round, Meng has already beaten Bam Bam Bigelow. Yeah, he goes for the tongue and death grip and Bigelow bumps. So Meng just follows him to the ground and grabs his neck. Yeah. Submits him. I like this Ming. <laughs> Tell me more. It is funny, though. I, I'm just amazed at how... Well, like, Bigelow... It's one of those things where... I had forgotten that Bigelow came in. And then when we actually watched that Nitro where he debuted and he was going after Goldberg and it was so awesome, it's like, how the fuck did I forget this? Now I know! <laughs> they turned him into just another geek yes. losing the Ming on Thunder. Yes. And it didn't take long. No. So we had a U.S. title tournament match here of Scott Steiner and Chris Jericho. Scott Steiner is very, very strong. Chris Jericho is relatively very small. So we had a very fun display of one slam after another. It was great. I like watching big people destroy small people. Jericho made a comeback, hit a lion salt, tried the lion tamer, but Scott broke free, hit a low blow right in front of the ref. And the Steiner recliner for the win. And this was, in fact, a win. It wasn't bad. Jericho got heat from this crowd. That was a win. Yeah. Almost no one else did. Cameron walked in and he looks at the TV and he goes, Who's that? I said, That's uh, Scott Steiner. Cameron then goes, Does he do steroids? Craig, you better have answered no. 
The man has never failed a test. He is, he is a clean athlete with great genetics, just like his brother Rick. That's correct. Rick Flair versus Rey Mysterio Jr. First of all, Michael Buffer referred, referred to Ray as the master of the Latino Frankensteiner. Which I thought was German. Well, hey, you know, I mean, that was the finish. So was it? that was a good way I to so. uh, kick this off, yeah. So, Ric Flair, let's be honest, has one match. He has a few variations of this one match. But it doesn't matter if he's a heel or a babyface, he gets his ass kicked all the goddamn time. If he's a heel... He gets his ass kicked like a, in a bumbling manner, makes the baby face look like a god. If he's a baby face, he gets his ass kicked constantly, but he's still fighting, to, so you have sympathy for him. But he's in here with Rey Mysterio Jr., who is tiny, so it would not make sense for Flair to be on offense for 80% of this match. I think Ric Flair got more offense in this match than maybe in other, any other match he had in years. Yeah. Well, not only that, but like he has a few things that he does when he's selling. And, like, usually Flair will just do his match with everybody. Mm-hmm. He went in there and decided, I'm going to do Rey Mysterio's match. Basically. I'm going to let him do all of his lucha, and I'm going to take everything. And Ric Flair's like a great athlete. He's not the most coordinated guy in the world. Sure. Trying to take a lucha arm drag, it's just a mess. <laughs> he took a springboard X-Factor and a top rope Frank, etc. All of these different moves in this match, and it was just like... Man, that's the first time he ever took that move in his life. Oh, yeah. And probably the last. Yeah. So, this was like a match you would see at WrestleMania weekend 2018. Yes. Basically. Like yeah, somebody's you're, putting you're right. a, what kind of wacky match can we put together for this uh, super show? Hey, let's do Ric Flair, Rey Mysterio. Nobody could imagine seeing that. Well, here we saw it in 1999. Yes. And it wasn't very good. It was, yeah. No. no it was, I didn't mind it. I, I, it I mean, was, it wasn't it was, bad. It was not very good. Yeah. yeah. It was It was a little clunky. It was a, I thought it was a, a fine Nitro Mean event. Nothing. I'd give, it, I'd give it two and a half. That's fair. Better than average. Nothing special. It's not very good. Yeah. So the best part to me is right before the finish when uh, Flair is sitting on the top rope. It, it, I assume he did the flip over spot one of the top rope. Anyway, he's sitting on the top rope and ready to drop kicks him. And Flair sells it by like, <laughs> leaning back and windmilling his arms and teasing falling for like an hour. Yeah. He's just going like this over and over and over and over. Now, before we get to that spot, first, Ray makes a little it comeback. Ray makes a little bit of a comeback, and he goes for like a spinning wheel kick. Yes. And Ric Flair had ducked for some reason, mm. and Ray just flies right over his head. Mm-hmm. And Rick didn't mean to duck. I don't even know why he went down, but... Ray just misses him. So Ray jumps up and drop kicks him. Flair cuts him off, and here was the thing. Flair starts to go through the ropes because he's going to climb up on top because he expected to be thrown off. But he's halfway through the ropes, and he remembers, oh, shit. So he climbs back in Mm -hmm. and starts climbing up from the inside, which Ric Flair never does. No. And so Ray drop kicks his knee as he's sitting on the top rope. And that's when Flair does a, whoa. I may fall into the water right here. Like your chair was about to give out. Yep. Yep. So, as Flair is windmilling his arms, Ray jumps up there, hits a top rope Rana. No one died. And the ref counts one and two, and then Arn Anderson yanks the referee out of the ring. Back when that was a DQ. Yeah. And the ref, who is Charles Robinson, who is Ric Flair's buddy now, calls the DQ, so Ray wins. And then... (laughs) Let me explain how this is set up first. (laughs) This, This saved the show. I won't lie. You know how I am with water. Before Ric Flair goes into the water, they they only have like a few seconds left. this is the key. They were in a hurry. So Flair rolls out of the ring, and I can't remember what happened. Like, Arn got involved earlier. Arn actually took a bump with his bad neck outside. So all you need to know is that Flair goes outside... And he leans against the bar- the metal barricade, and he puts his hands up on it, and he kind of just stretches up tall, and then he gets back in the ring to the spot. Because he went out there to make sure that he was going to get over that barricade <laughs> yeah. before he went through with it. Yes. So then, after he went like this to make sure he could do it, he goes back in, Ray drop kicks him, and then Flair does a big backwards bump over the thing and lands in the way. Everybody goes crazy. Go to blank. <laughs> it was that fast. They had like six seconds to spare. I was like, you can't show Ric Flair selling in the water. No. Like, the bump is part of it, but the selling of the water, yeah, that's that's the main thing we're looking for here. Yeah. Ah, what can you do? Brian, my music, please. Ah. I'm just so disgusted. 
Here we go. The finishes on this show were five clean pins in a row, pin after he's shoved by Stevie Ray, DQ due to belt usage, submission after a low blow, and DQ due to yanking the referee out of the ring. Man. Excellent. The raw one will be more involved. It sure will. Holy smokes. So yeah, that was Nitro Club of Vela. Yeah, it sucked. Bad show. Depressing. <laughs> we are at war! Oh, I got a lot to talk about with this wrestling show here. Well, let me tell you. Let's begin. Monday Nitro number 185, March 29th, 1999, from the lovely city of Toronto. Yeah. I've never been there, but I've heard. So I've been there. It's lovely. David Flair and Tori Wilson are having a black and white date, calling Ric Flair a loser. They're literally having a fireside chat. Yes. They're both sitting on a chair. Mm -hmm. They're kind of staring into each other's eyes, Mm -hmm. except David's awkward. Right. There's a fire in the background, like in a fireplace. Sure. Yes. Not like arson. Important detail. And like, she's sort of touching him, but not really. She's kind of got her hand like near him. (laughs) Well, that's not touching then, is it? And he's like... I can't believe my dad is such a loser. I did. I, I'm sorry. Too much. I, 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 I'll try it again. Yeah. I can't believe my dad is. Too much. I can't believe. I can't do it. <laughs> it's impossible. It's literally impossible. To imitate the lack of enthusiasm David Flair had here. I can't believe my dad is such a loser. Anyway, Tori can believe it. I can't believe my dad is such a loser. No, no, no one can do it. <laughs> He's more talented than I thought. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> So, anyway, yeah, his dad's a loser, and Hollywood's the dad he never had. Mm-hmm. The announcers were pushing a Volkswagen Beetle. They were giving away... <laughs> Not <to> literally. Av- <laughs> no, actually, no, that's a good point. They're not actually pushing it. They were promoting it. Right. Uh, they're giving away this Beetle as an advertisement for a video game. It just struck me as a very nitro thing to do. Mm-hmm. They always did this weird stuff. Yeah. Surprised they didn't have a guy driving it. Like their official... WCW official Beetle driver? Yeah. And have Ricky Rackman interview him. And they'd interview him, yeah, and he'd just be like a normal guy yes. with nothing to fucking say, yeah. and they'd just go on and on. So David Flair then. Yeah. So, yeah, the crowd was demanding Bret Hart from the get-go, and they showed Bret last week claiming he could beat Goldberg in five minutes. Then they went to commercial. Mm-hmm. That was the first segment, everyone. Okay, they re-aired Conan's music video. No disco this time. How many weeks does this go on? Dude, mm-hmm. I don't know. It's a good video. We saw it for like six weeks by itself. And then like three weeks of disco, and now we're back to it by itself. Sure, yeah. Listen, it's a fine video. I've seen it now. Well, you know, new viewers. <laughs> so Conan, Conan comes out and does a spiel. He starts to run down disco when Vincent inter- interrupts. They had the worst... Excuse back- me. <laughs> excuse me. Are you telling me that the opener on this episode of Nitro, the first match on the show, yes. mm-hmm. is Conan versus Vincent? Is that what you're telling me? Hey, that's, that's a step up from Van Hammer and... Bull pain. In what way is Vincent Conan is a step a star. up? Well, he is, but Vincent is a step down from both those guys. It's a lateral move at best. It is. It is well, before, a terrible match on paper. Yes. It was a terrible match in the ring. It absolutely was. Although my my standard Vincent did one thing smart is that he he had his first match in years three or four weeks ago, and he did the worst match there could ever be. So now whenever he comes out and does a match, no matter how bad it is, I think, eh, better than that other one. So his match is impact testing. Basically, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Gave me a concussion. Before the match <laughs> Before the match, they had the worst back and forth on the mic ever. Zero chemistry. Vincent actually got the last word in. Because Conan was just he frustrated. Shut up. <laughs> he was just frustrated. I'm done. Vincent just kept talking and talking and talking, and Conan tried to get some time and Conan said, Fuck this. <laughs> I'll let you have the mic, Vincent. So as I wrote here, Vincent was he was merely terrible. I do believe at one point he had a reverse atomic drop that legit crunched Conan's huevos. We were one match in, one match in, and the announcers are already talking over themselves and calling <laughs> and calling each other out on it. Mm-hmm. So Stevie Ray comes out and distracts Vincent. Conan cuts Vincent off, hooks the tequila sunrise for the win. Whoop de shit. Bobby wasn't even there yet. It was no. It no was this is Mike and Larry and Larry. Tony. Yeah. yeah. Oh God. Now see, I can understand Tony getting frustrated with Larry. Not you guys, Bobby. You guys really hate Larry. No, I don't hate Larry. I didn't say anything negative about Larry. I don't like Larry. I was just pointing out if it was bad with Larry, just wait till Bobby gets there. So Hogan and Tori are now having a chat about the flares. For some reason, they began to talk about the finger poke of doom. <laughs> yeah. So Tori, well, 
She goes, Hulk, you know that David considers you like a father to him. And Hogan's all cool with that. And then she starts going, her, she is trying to stir shit between Hogan and Nash. Right. Okay. That's her goal. Mm -hmm. So she brings up the finger poke of doom where Hulk Hogan touched Nash. Yes. And he fell down and was beaten for the title. Yes. She goes, was that real? That's what she said. <laughs> and Hogan goes, yeah, of course. And she goes, well, always a worker. Do you think that you could beat him again? Oh, hell yeah, of course. That's the beginning. He whispers something in her ear and she giggles. Yeah. Then me and Gene brings Hogan out for a promo. As usual in Canada, he's utterly beloved. And so, I mean, he's been doing the, the sort of double turn with Flair anyway, but he just says, hell with it, I'm going to be a babyface today. And he cut a babyface Hulk Hogan promo. The whole show, except her on vignettes. Yeah. He's going to beat Ric Flair and take the world championship back. Do it for those brothers who asked him about the border and tested his biceps at 24 and a half inches. Well, I mean, this was supposed to be a babyface turn a couple of weeks ago. He's supposed to be a babyface. But man, did they go crazy for this guy. This was a preview of Rock versus Hogan three years <laughs> yes. from now. Yes, it was. That's what this was. And Almost he, of the day. He knew they loved him, so he went into full old school Hulk Hogan mode. Yeah. All of his crazy promos he used to cut that didn't make any sense. Custom guy. He claimed he showed up at customs and a dude measured his arms. Yeah. yeah. He had gained a quarter inch. Well, Brian, they, they are very careful about the weapons that are allowed into Canada. I guess so. Had yeah. to get them guns tested. And then once they tested the guns, they said, who are you going to beat up tonight? That's right. And he said, I'm going to beat up Ric Flair. So he finishes and answer, announcers say, oh, by the way, there are rumors that Sting was spotted going through customs. Kind of hard to miss. You would think. Yeah. Probably got pulled over that little building with the face paint, I imagine. I would think so. I'm not going to try that. Well, I had the worst experience. Oh no. Which time? Dude. You went through a, a border crossing and face paint? Not border crossing, but I, I went through the metal detectors and everything. The security checkpoint at the airport. I see. Okay, yeah. Ah. Dude. Were <laughs> like, you in face paint? No, but... I, I don't see where we're going with this. It sucks! <laughs> Sorry you had a bad day. Fucking, I get, I'm, I'm about to go through, and I'm like, do I have to take out... What do I have to take out here? And he goes, just make sure your shoes are off. I said, do I have to take my computer out of the bag? He oh. said, no, you don't have to take it out of your bag. Just oh, leave guy, everything in there. I've messed you up. Then I fucking get five feet further, and the guy's like, do you have any electronics? Well, yeah, I got a computer and an iPad. Got to take all that out. And I'm like, this fucking guy right in front of me. Mm -hmm. It was another security guy who told me I didn't. It was a mess. Why can't people get their stories straight? DDP video package. Going back to Scott Steiner trying to fuck his wife, and then Kimberly got hurt. So Mike today does a sit-down interview with Paige. He assures, Paige asserts today Kimberly is doing well. Says after the attack by Scott Steiner on him, he had not been seen in six weeks or whatever. He's been suffer, suffering from a herniated disc, causing him to lose a feeling in his legs, but he's back at 100% now. This was so corny. It was weird. You're playing it straight here, Vinny. This was a pre-taped segment yeah. that they decided that they were going to produce. Mm. And there's like, you know, camera cuts and yeah. Mike Tanay just doing the most over-the-top overacting. He's Mike Tanay turned up to 10. Oh, my God. Turned up to 10. Like DDP then gets turned up to 10. He's never not a salesman, but man. So Tanay starts to talk about how Paige had suffered an injury against Steiner but never submitted and Paige says, hey, you're making excuses for me. And then Paige, or Tanae asks about the stipulation that Steiner would get Kimberly for 30 days. And Paige said, anyone who believed that was an idiot? Tanae called him the people's champion. Paige said, knock off the hype. And he looked into the camera. <laughs> knock off the hype? Yeah, he just, That's his gimmick. Well, yeah. not anymore, apparently. It's so goofy. I don't know. He looked into the camera and he vowed to get Steiner his way. And we're talking about Hogan and Flair is every, and now with, with Paige, is every single person in this company a tweener right now? Are there lines drawn? Well, Maybe Hulk, Ray is a face. No, Vinny, you're just not paying attention. Hulk Hogan is a baby face, Ric Flair is a heel, and Diamond Dallas Page is a baby face. He is? Now, he turned on the crowd later. Yeah, he sure did. Because he challenged Scott Steiner, and he called him Big Papa 
douchebag or something. Big, Big Papa, Papa Scum. That's his gimmick. And the fans booed. So he got upset and said, oh, so you like guys that throw girls out of cars? Well, you're all jack-offs. That's why he turned on the crowd. They were making fun of his wife in his mind. But yeah, he's supposed to be a baby face. All right. Today, I don't know. <laughs> Wrath versus Kenny Chaos. Yeah, who's the baby face here? Uh, they're both heels. No one. They're both villains out to ruin I think my Wrath day. Wrath is a baby face. He's supposed to be. He's he a big work. scary guy who wins a lot and most of the time. He and didn't work, baby face. Took him eight eight minutes. Actually, eight forty nine. I did count forty nine to beat Kenny <laughs> Chaos, and not only that, they gave Kenny Chaos a comeback. Yeah. yeah. He had a near fall. You're begging people to change the channel. I like when Nash hit, t- or Nash, Wrath hit 10,000 moves in a row, and move number 954 was a chin lock. Yeah. I killed my own joke. You see the bicycle kick on this uh, particular matchup? I did not. I will say, it, to, to be fair, Wrath had a really cool standing drop kick here. He also got a bicycle kick and kicked this man right square in the nose. I buy that totally. How long do we talk about this match? Yeah, we're done. I'm done. It went too long. Wrath hit the meltdown for the pin. Nash was talking to Tori. He wanted to know about David. She only wanted to talk about the finger poke. And, and uh, you know, when Hogan beat him, and could he beat him again? I got to admit, Nash was just a great heel. And he is a heel. I guess. Vinny, in this segment. <sighs> she goes, you know, Hogan said that he beat you for real. And Nash says... He touched me with one finger. And then his exact quote was, look at me. You think he can actually beat me? You know, because he's tall. Because he's big. He's taller and has better hair. Sure. So, yeah, he was appalled that she thought Hogan could really beat him. And he said, this is all really interesting. Which I... I, He says, it's real, all right. Real interesting. This is very bad. <laughs> we, are, we are being far too kind. To Tori's <laughs> acting is horrific. And she's actually been decent, like the first few TV shows she did. Yeah. This stuff is just bad. So me and Gene brings out Flair. And I had the comment about the announcers earlier, but here was where I really noticed it was Tony in particular. Gene says, they're hanging from the rafters here in Toronto. And Tony says, Gene says that every week. There's never anyone hanging from the raster, rafters. It would be a terrible seat if it was. So the fans call Flair an asshole. And Gene says, we'll edit that chant out later. And Tony just <laughs> says, it's live. He's just sick of just everyone. Done. Just done. Like, <laughs> every single person who works at WCW is now his mortal enemy. This is this is Friday afternoon at 2.50. He later, is done. Later in the evening, my favorite Tony is, is <laughs> they're doing Hogan DDP. And they're brawling all over the place. They destroy the announce table. They try to destroy the big, giant, metal WCW yes. sign. <laughs> and Mike Tanay goes, they're going to tear this city down. And Tony very calmly says, they're not going to tear the city down, Mike. <laughs> it's a pretty big city. <laughs> Tony's this, the man on the show. And then he goes, you know, we hype things up a lot, <laughs> but that's ridiculous. <laughs> Tony Schiavone, Tony was... the greatest night in the history of our sport. We hype things up a lot, Tony, but that's ridiculous. They're not going to tear all of Toronto <laughs> he down. He reached his bullshit <laughs> limit, and he was having none of it. Tony is an angry drunk. <laughs> I... Oh, he's not drinking. I also came to the conclusion yes. that he was not in, at 100%. No, he's just over it. So Come on. So Flair comes Pay out. Pay this man some respect. <laughs> They're in Toronto, so he threatens to beat up the hockey player, Ty Domi. And he says, the only country in the world where I can make a $100 bill last for a week at the Marriott. And, of course, I am not Ric Flair, so I thought, how is that a bad thing? Well, with the, with the exchange rate, I'm sure you get a little yeah. bit. So DDP comes out, and they get in each other's fl- faces, and Flair says, I have the book. And I acknowledge, you've elevated to great heights, much to my dismay. Says, I got the book again, I can bury you like I used to. Yes. And DDP goes, it must have killed you to have to call me a superstar when I came out here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So, Flair books Paige against Hogan. Hogan comes out. Paige says if he has to go through Hogan and then take Flair's belt to get to Steiner, that's what he's going to do. Okay, I understand he's angry at this man for hurting his wife. (laughs) The world title should not be a stepping stone to anything. He threw his wife out of the car, Vinny. He did. (laughs) 
Hogan and Page. Uh, they both accepted the match. Then Flair made himself Page's manager. They're all screaming at each other. And they cut to, ironically, the rafters. And there is, in fact, Sting. There is a seat up there. He was not hanging from them. Vinny, if, if Craig threw Bridget out of a moving car, and your response was, I want the world title? I'm going to take that Texarkana title from Brian so that I can get a hold of you. That's hmm. really, really stupid. His wife should be his number one priority over the world title. Yeah. She was thrown from a moving car. The other thing is, if, if Craig threw Bridget out of a moving car, she would beat his ass. Well, that's true. That's true. She yeah. would get up, dust herself off, and <laughs> run and chase the car. My and... wife takes no shit. Yeah. Uh, anyway, Flair demanded Sting come down to the ring. Sting refused. Hey, he's in the rafters in 1999. And then he's up there in the rafters in the white paint and everything like that. Mm-hmm. And Ric Flair says, and I quote, Sting, get down here. I'm the president. Don't go flying around without telling me. Yeah. He's not a bat. We never saw him again. No. Sting had to fly up, cross the border, put on his makeup, be on TV for 10, 15 seconds, take his makeup off, fly back across the border, and go home. Oh, maybe he was wearing the makeup. That's why he got stopped at the border. I guess so. Scott Norton versus Rick Steiner. This was fun. Oh, yeah. It was. I was expecting more. Because Scott Norton didn't sure. want to do a job. Well, that Scott Norton definitely did not want to do a job, and Rick Steiner didn't want to actually work. Well, Rick Steiner didn't want to mess with Norton either. That's possible, too. Yeah, it's true. So, they're talking about cauliflower ears because of Rick Steiner's headgear. and <laughs> uh, Shivani starts making fun of Larry's ears. Mm-hmm. He should get those fixed. And Larry says, I'll keep them, but it scares guys in the golf course. Shivani says, you're not going to scare a pro golfer with a cauliflower ear. <laughs> Can't handle it. So, Rick, half-assing it, still threw Scott Norton around like I've never seen before. And they were brawling on the floor, and Rick threw him into the post a bunch of times, hit the diving bulldog. Ref counted three. Norton kicked out at 3.1. It was not as good as I expected. Mm-mm. Rey Mysterio Jr. was backstage asking Kidman to team with him tonight. He said Benoit and Malenko had an open challenge. Kidman did not want to at first. They had a singles match booked against each other later, but Ray talked him into it. Ray says, let's just worry about tonight for now. We know everything about each other. Let's go out there and win those titles. Kidman agreed. Now this match, Chris Adams versus Booker T. This was fun. I liked it. I don't know what Booker T did to Chris Adams, but he was pissed. And it looked like there were liberties taken there may have been. by both men may in have this been. match. Hey, it worked. It, made, it, it entertained me. So <laughs> here was where I determined Tony had been drinking. <laughs> He's just openly buries Mike Tanay for plugging his hotline. Says he won't say anything on TV, but I'll plug his hotline all damn day. And then Tanay says something like, well, what about what Larry said? And Shorty finally says, I'm not even listening to Larry right now. <laughs> Just, he's had it up to here. He can't take anymore. So they had what up to this point, I think by the end, was still the best match of the night on either show. When Booker hit his drop kick, you got to see Chris Adams sell this drop kick. Mm-hmm. Dropping his arms, looking at the sky, and then collapsing. It was great. The fans booed a handshake and then cheered for a, the opposite of a clean break, a, a kick in the corner. Tony, Shivani's just appalled at the state of the world. He can't take it. That's Booker came back. Here, here's what I loved about this match most of all. I've said this before, but it's true. Not every match needs three dozen near falls. There was a heat segment. Booker cut him off. Booker hit his comeback, hit his finish, and won. Simple. Don't make me work as a fan to keep track of what's going on. So yeah, Booker won. It was a fun match. Yep, great super kick by Adams on the outside. Problem was nobody took Chris Adams seriously. And how could you? He hasn't won sure. a match on, on Nitro. Problem with this show. It's like if you look up and down the show, I mean, let's take the quality of the match out of the show. All right. On the other on the other channel, it's a bunch of stars facing each other. Mm-hmm. Or guys who are pushed to stars. This show you've got Conan and Vincent. Wrath and Kenny Chaos. Yeah. Scott Norton and Rick Steiner. Chris Adams and Booker T. Chris Jericho and Jerry Flynn. Yes. Like, what? Who is that? They got 400 fucking wrestlers <laughs> under contract. Yeah. And that's barely an exaggeration. Mm-hmm. It was like yeah. 360 to 380. Mm-hmm. That's the matches they put together on a three-hour Nitro. Absolutely. And here was where the show peaked. 
And by the show, I mean the entire run of WCW Monday Nitro. It starts with the same Rey Mysterio promo they played last week. This is all the one hour, 60 minute mark into the show, by the way. I, I recommend you all go there immediately. So the promo ends. They just play Ray's promo from last week. And then Shivani and Tanae had the following conversation, which I wrote down word for word. Tony begins. He made this challenge to Kidman. And let's go take a look at what he said last week. <laughs> let's pause. Tanae says, Tony, we just saw what he did last week. To which Shivani replies, oh, we did? I didn't get a countdown. We saw it? All right, well, sorry, fans. That's what happened a week ago. Then Tony and our, uh, Bobby begin to argue about Jerry Flynn's nickname, whether it's Thunderfoot or Lightning Toes, whatever. Right. And Tanae says, well, you can see it says Lightning Foot on his tights. And then now Shivani's turning on Tanae. His back's to the, or his face is to the camera, Tanae. We can't see his tights. And now Tanae has had enough of Tony. Mm -hmm. Well, we've only seen Jerry Flynn for months and months in this show. We've had many opportunities to determine that is, his name is written on the back of his tights. And on the back of his tights, we all know it reads Thunderfoot. Lightning foot. Lightning foot, whatever. So they are... Oh, you idiot. They're arguing about <laughs> no camera wonder. angles. They're arguing about, arguing about where Jericho is from. From the one minute or one hour, 16 second mark for the next 90 seconds to two minutes, the funniest thing that ever happened on Nitro. I was dying. It was awesome. Well, man, it's going to be your lucky day then, dude. Because we got years left of this. <laughs> hey, you know what? You think it just ends right here? I hated it at the time. If it's, if, it, if it's like this every week, maybe I'll like it in round two. So, Jericho and Jerry Flynn. Well, see, it's different now. Mm -hmm. Because at the time, you hate it. Because you're hoping this company succeeds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're, they're actively working against their own success. Yes. Now we know what happens. Yeah. They're fucking going out of business. They sure are. So what the hell does it matter what these idiots are saying on commentary? Let's just enjoy it. Oh, God. So Jericho and Flynn, Jericho cuts a promo. It's a very baby-faced promo, and until the very end, when he swerves him and says, I'm so glad I moved to the States. Canadians, Canadians suck. So they demand Brett. They didn't get him. Had a fun back-and-forth match until the very end. They're trying to do some kind of power bomb roll up spot oh, with the ropes more the last liber 2 minutes of this match yeah more liberties here if you ask me oh the, no the it's just they screwed everything there was, up there's one more so. liberties they they fucked up that roll up they're all in the ropes mm -hmm. and they give up and they just let go and start to stand up and Jericho gets to his feet first and Jericho kicks Jerry Flint in the eyeballs yes just punts him right in the face Flint didn't kill him lucky for Jericho and they improvise another spot with Jericho getting his feet on the ropes this time to win. And he rolls out of the ring, and you can tell he's still pissed. This was a total struggle at the end. Yeah. Yes. And a weird match. And you know what? Listen, who's the biggest Jerry Flynn fan? You. Yeah. I admit no one else is. <laughs> it's right. Jericho versus Jerry Flynn. You should love this match. You're missing my point. Am I? Can we can we figure out how to book a show at some point? <laughs> the fuck is all of this? Finally, the show turned around with Bret Hart. Yeah, no, 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 no. Before we get to that, Mean Gene and Spice showed off the Beatle again. Oh god! And they're showing it off like a, like a, it's, it's like watching Price is Right with a uh, Bob Barker and a model. Sure, show off the car without you know all the harassment and such. Probably. Yeah. So they go to break. They come back. Shivani's confused. He tries to throw it to Gene in the car again. But of course, they already showed that, so then they go into the match. And all I can think is, we are, watch we are watching with our own eyes, this ship is sinking. And Tony Schiavone is frantically trying to climb from deck to deck to deck, trying to keep his head above water. <laughs> I think the ship is sinking, and he's got a bucket, and he's putting more water in the <laughs> Maybe the other way to look at it. what he's doing. So Bret Hart comes out. Before the promo starts, Heenan says, and Heenan, by the way, by this point, he knows Tony's on edge, and now he's needling him. Hey, Tony! And it's a pause, and then you hear, What? Brain? <laughs> oh, I remember this. So someone, Incredible. Someone who has more time and technical ability than I do, please just edit down every word Tony Schiavone says in this show for me. <laughs> it would be like a one 20-minute audio file, and I'll love it. It was something where, where Heenan goes, Hey, Tony! There's a long pause. <laughs> Tony goes, Yes, Brain? And he goes, you want to know what I think? And Tony goes, no. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't write everything down. And so Bobby goes, well, I'm going to tell you what I think. And Tony goes, see, fans, <laughs> we don't want to hear what he has to say, but he's just going to say it anyway. Mm -hmm. Then Bobby goes, well, fine, I'm not going to say it. 
Tony goes, what are you going to say? I'm not going to say it. This happened to everyone. He's not making a So up. then they start cutting to Brett coming down to the ring, and they're still going. <laughs> and Tony's like, all right, Bobby, just tell us what you want to say right now. And Bobby goes, I'm not going to say it. Tony goes, you've forgotten. Your brain is empty. Bobby goes, no, it's not empty. I just don't want to tell you now. Just on and on. The best and then, Tony, and then Bobby's like, just go home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or no, Heenan goes, just go home. And Tony goes, I don't live in Canada. This is off the top of my head, by the way. I didn't yeah. write any of this down. <laughs> no. he, he goes, just go home. Tony goes, I don't live in Canada. And I forget what Bobby said after that, but... They, they were just, just yelling at each other. They lost. Leave. Yeah. Yes. This, this is this is like two six year olds on a playground arguing. It was awesome. <laughs> so Bret Hart, he's in Canada. He recites the lyrics to "O Canada." Notes he's a five time world champion. Can't get a match with anybody. He starts rattling off names like Flair and Hogan, and the fans who cheered all these men earlier are now booing them every time their names come up. He was the one guy. Mm. He could bury everybody, including Hulk Hogan. Mm -hmm. And they loved him. And then hated the guys he was burying. And finally, he gets to William Goldberg. You big chicken. (laughs) Big chicken. (laughs) He said Goldberg, and I don't know, this must have been in some press PR deal or something. He said Goldberg was putting up money to fight Steve Austin. No, this was months ago when Goldberg went on The Tonight Show and challenged Steve Austin. Mm. Oh, I remember that now. Yes, it was very, very dumb. It was lame. Yeah. Low rent. Yeah. But Brett says, I fought Steve Austin a bunch of times, and every time I fought him, I beat him. He says, Goldberg, you think you're a big, tough football player, but this is hockey country. And at this point, he removes one hockey sweater to reveal another hockey sweater. Toronto Maple Leafs. Yeah, he went to Toronto. So Goldberg comes out to very clearly piped-in chants, because these fans are booing him. They're still... Yeah, they were like afraid he might get booed. It's like, you're in Toronto. What the fuck were you expecting with Bret Hart out there, you yeah. idiots? So Goldberg comes out, and this is actually very famous. I thought this happened later in the timeline. So did I. I thought it was in the summer. I thought it was after Bret got hurt, but clearly it wasn't. Goldberg gets the ring and spears Bret, but then both men are down. They both collapse. They're both just laying there for a few minutes. I, like, I remember this, but what I'd forgotten was Goldberg gets in the ring and spears the guy... And they both lay there. Mm-hmm. And I mean, they laid there forever. Minutes. And I got to give Brett like a little bit of credit because, I mean, even though he's wearing a metal plate, he did take a spear from William Goldberg. Yeah. So he should have been down for His a His whole while. body mm-hmm. is shaken up. Yeah. But I mean, man, he sold that thing forever before he woke up. So eventually he wakes up, he stirs, he rolls Goldberg over, counts his own pin, the place goes crazy. And then Brett stands up, takes off the second hockey sweater, revealing... A metal plate over his stomach. He cuts a promo, says, tells Goldberg to respect that, then tells Bischoff and WCW, I quit. And the announcers are very unconcerned with this main eventer allegedly quitting. Yeah, they're like, what does that mean? He's quitting the match? <laughs> so this is very, very famous, as we all noted, even though we all thought it came later. In hindsight, it's pretty silly. Bret Hart's whole plan to prove he was a better wrestler than Goldberg was to fashion a custom-made armor plate over his gut. Yeah. And then fool him into spearing him. Hey, it worked. Did it? Yeah, he knocked the guy out. He proved he's a better wrestler. He got a, he got a visual pinfall on the guy. I see. He's only the second guy ever to get that. That's actually a valid And point. he didn't use a cattle prod. No, he did not. <laughs> it, was, it was on the up and up. And just as he's leaving, Eric Bischoff comes out to make it real. What are you doing? And then we never saw him again either. Well, we did in the uh, recap. After they come back from commercial, they showed the whole thing just so you knew it was... Although, you know, I remember that night. I mean, there were a lot of people that thought he put a fucking metal plate under his jersey, knocked out Goldberg for real, got a visual pinfall, and then quit WCW. Can you believe that? No, actually. The 90s. More fun with the announcers. They're panning the uh, fans. And Shivani notes a lovely young lady in the crowd. He then says, the one with the goatee. Tony says, what do you think, idiot? (laughs) He says, are you talking to Tanae? (laughs) I might be, actually. (laughs) Tony just hates them both. At this point, had I been paying more attention in 1999, I would have paid more money to see Tony fight his announcers than any other match (laughs) WCW could have put together. So Buff Bagwell comes out for a promo. 
He confirms he and Scott Steiner are no more. Their, their coupling has come undone. They've broken up. So his fans can cheer for whoever they want, but he loves them as much as they love him. Which is actually a great line, because it sounds like he's sucking up to the fans, but if you listen to what he actually says, he's just saying, if you boo me, I'll be a dick. Buff Bagwell versus Norman Smiley. Norman Smiley's real name is Norman Smiley. Yes. I thought that was your fact of the day. Okay. Thank it's you. one of those guys where, you know, sometimes you're... Sometimes you see a guy and you hear his wrestling name and... Can't be real. It's like, why did you come up with that? You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like Bobby Fish was one of them. It's yeah. kind of like, why Why did you call yourself Bobby Fish? Like, you like fish? Then it turns out that's his last name. Yes. Then I felt kind of dumb. But, you know, I kind of thought that about Norman Smiley. Like, why, why did you choose Smiley? And it turned out that's his last name. He should have been a dentist. So Buff wrestled exactly like he did in the NWO. Posing constantly, laughing at himself, intimidating the ref. Norman's entire heat was just neck cranks, which is pretty much going to be every Buff Bagwell match until the end of time. And then Buff made his comeback and won with a blockbuster. This was not terrible. That was all right. Then the announcers actually appeared on camera for banter. <laughs> and this was the moment Brian was talking about earlier. where the yeah, I like this one. <laughs> yelling at each other, openly calling each other dumb, openly telling each other to go home. <laughs> I felt it was kind of lighthearted at this point. It may have been. Yeah. I don't think fists were going to fly at any point. But Well, they didn't, so, I mean, what does that tell you? I know Bobby and Tony weren't the best buds during this period. But that You don't say. Yeah, but they were having fun here, I thought. I was. Chris Benoit and Dean Malenko versus Rey Mysterio Jr. and Kidman. Holy smokes! Finally, Benoit and Malenko have a good match. <laughs> I mean, Can you believe we'd ever actually say that? Yes. They've bored me half to death for the last three weeks. Heenan starts making jokes about getting cheap baseball tickets, and there is a long, long pause, and Tony says, I wouldn't go to a baseball game with you two clowns if my life depended on it. So, it was a good match. It was kind of weird, because it felt like they were building to a quick finish, and then they just cut Kidman off, and suddenly they go to commercial. Yeah, by the way, Ray has debuted his Team 3D overalls, which he wears for like a couple <laughs> years now. Yeah, yeah. They are oh. absolutely atrocious. They're hideous. Why was he wrestling in Oshkosh's? <laughs> well, they fit him. Just, I was disgusted. <laughs> well, he wears them, I, I think, until he's WCW getting goes heavier. Under. Keeps getting heavier mm-hmm. here. My my son actually brought this up because he was watching this with me. He says Ray's not wearing a mask. Yeah, I said right. And then we watched the New Japan show, and Ray was so quick to put his mask back on after he'd been unmasked, and he asked me why that is, Dad. The answer is because they took it without his, well, I can't say permission, but he had a good point for an 11 year old. Well, yeah, you're not supposed to put the damn mask back on, but you're not supposed to book pro wrestling terribly either. <laughs> so I side with Ray. Let me yeah. write this down. Yes. Yeah. Tony scolds Heenan for marking out for big moves. It broke down into a four, uh, four way. And I do mean it broke down as Benoit and uh, was it Benoit Kidman brawling on the floor. Yes, Benoit and Kidman are brawling on the floor forever, and the ref was distracted. So Malenko has like a submission and a couple of pins behind the ref's back, and he never cares that the ref isn't paying attention. He just keeps doing more moves. <laughs> well, he does care, but he he he's not a he's not a. How do you know? Well, he never shows emotion. Right. Yeah. This is. A, but you know he has emotion. Yeah. He's How? Just, he's the ice man. I, well, it's not in his program for he, this match. If he cared, he would have grabbed the ref or tapped him on the shoulder or something. Well, sometimes he goes, all right, Dubai. You know, he does those promos where he just. You know what I'm talking about? No, so, do that Ray, again. Do that again. He's not doing it. Okay, Raven and Saturn come out. Bobby, go home. <laughs> you go home. Raven. I live here. <laughs> Fine. Clowns. So Raven comes out and DDTs Dean and puts Ray on top, and the ref counts three, and there's a title change. Yeah, Raven. Yeah. Which is funny, because maybe... Because it doesn't make any sense. Well, it doesn't make any sense, but Spring Stampede is coming. Yeah, sure. sure. we went to. It was a very good show, in fact. But one of the matches on that show was Raven and Saturn against the Horsemen, which I, in my mind, I remember it being a title match. Maybe it's not. No, it was. Okay, so at some point here, the Horsemen get the belts back. Clips of Spring Breakout. 
Where would you put the over under on on the number of hookups resulting from these wrestlers hanging out from these young ladies in bikinis? Very, very small, Vinny. Really? Hmm. Yeah. That stuff didn't happen. Disappointing. DDP versus Hulk Hogan. Crowd loved Hogan and he just went straight babyface. Mm-hmm. It was like man. Hulkamania, man. He was feeling it this evening. He was. Hot crowd here in Toronto. These guys, they tried to tear the damn city down. They, they did tried. try to tear. They were so determined. They're doing a match that goes on for a while and it goes to break. And when it comes back, they're at the announce desk. The announcers are gone. And I, I just assumed they would never, either, they would either never come back or they would join in the fight. <laughs> then Hogan and Paige go over to the stage. They got the big steel girder WCW letters on both sides. And, and this they, was the best. We, yeah. They determined we are going to knock these fucking things to the ground. And they hit, they whipped each other into them and there's a big clang. And they would go. So they just go over and over again. That is no, it's even better teetering. because like they throw each other into them and they clang into these things and they kind of go like this. They clang into them again. They go like this. Then Hogan like throws him into it and DDB clangs into it, but then lays on it. And then Hogan goes and he's like pushing. Yes, mm-hmm. like we're gonna get this they, fucking they, thing. They, we're they gonna knock working, it over. They were blatantly working together to push this over by the end. They didn't. They got, they got one, one of them. them. Kind of, yeah, yeah. I guess so. No, they got one of them. Yeah. I don't believe that. So they go back to the ring. Flair goes after Hogan. Page goes after Flair. Hogan goes after Page. It was actually a great three-way fight there for a minute. Didn't make any sense because the ref's right there, but whatever. There was one spot before this where Hogan has a move. He has a technical move that he does. Yeah, strong style Hogan. Where the guy is like on all fours. He, and what? Hogan kind of sets it up like a La Mahi Stroll Cradle. He, but he basically causes the guy to do a forward roll, and he ends up in a cross arm break. It's the exact same arm bar Alberto Del Rio used in WWE, much, much, much slower. Kind of, yeah. Mm. But anyway, he goes through this move, and Paige is not rolling over. No. He's still on all fours. So Hogan just sits down and does a cross arm breaker yes. with DDP on his stomach, which means he's bending his arm this way, right. the way it's supposed to go. Mm-hmm. And he just lays there. <laughs> Shockingly, DDP does not submit to this <laughs> cross arm bender, I call it. So Shivani yells at Heenan for repeating himself. Ref goes down. Charles Robinson hits the ring. Hogan hulked up for what had to be the first Hulk up in years. Yes. Had a ball doing it. And I wonder if it was supposed to be a diamond cutter because Paige like just gave him a clothesline and then he popped up to do his Hulk up. So I don't know if, like, maybe, maybe the idea was. DDP hits him with the diamond cutter. Mm-hmm. Hogan hulks up. Mm-hmm. And in the middle of the match, DDP thought, this fucking guy ain't kicking out of my diamond cutter. <laughs> oh. So he hit a clothesline instead and was like, I forgot, brother. Fire up. And Hogan just fired up and Entirely possible. didn't have to no-sell the diamond cutter. So Hogan does his whole comeback. Flair hits the ring, swings a chair at Hogan, hits Paige instead. The lightest chair shot. Yeah. Yep. Like... Those of you that still remember the Landstorm chair shots in ECW and still badger him about it to this day, mm-hmm. watch this chair shot. Watch this chair shot. So now he goes after Hogan, hits 100 chops. Hogan no sells them all, hits the big boot, drops the leg on Paige, but Charles Robinson won't count. So Hogan punches out Robinson, and the first ref recovers it counts three. Yeah. So Paige, between the, pair, the, 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 the chair shot and the leg drop, was on his back for like three minutes here. Well, you know, they announced that now Hogan was in line for a title shot, and DDP obviously got screwed by a crooked ref. And so, basically, this is all leading to that four-way at Spring Stampede. I think it was a four-way. Yes. Where DDP walks out with the title. It was It's Paige, Hogan, Flair, and I, for the life of me, I can't remember the fourth person. Probably Nash or somebody. Yeah. So, anyway, I will remember this show for a long time due to Tony Schiavone's live meltdown. Let's see who was the fourth man. Oh, why it was Sting. Oh, okay, there you go. Who does Nash wrestle on this show? You do Nash and Goldberg. Oh, yeah, Nash Nash. and Goldberg, that's right. How about that? Scott Steiner, Booker T. Benoit Malenko versus Raven and Saturn. Mm -hmm. Ray versus Kidman again. Conan versus Disco. Scotty Riggs versus Mikey Whipwreck. Bam Bam Bigelow versus Hack. Yep, yep. And the Hoovy Blitzkrieg. Mm -hmm. Very famous match. It was a very good show. It was. Mm -hmm. And we got to see Hulk Hogan working us. That's right, we did. He was limping into a hotel. He had a fake... He was pretending he had a leg injury. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But he didn't have a leg injury. 
So we were out. We met Chris Benoit that night. We did. And we were we were in the parking lot. Mm-hmm. And there is like the hotel or whatever. This it, it was a building of some sort. It was the Sheridan downtown and the parking structure was adjacent to it, but there was like a side entrance. Yes. That he had to, he actually had to walk up. So he had to go to. through this entrance and there's nobody around. Like we looked up and it was like that it's the wall, brother. Like he's that far away. <laughs> yeah. And here's this dude just limping his way, limping his way. And it's like, that's fucking Hogan. He's selling his fake knee injury when nobody's around to get into this hotel. Yeah. It's very impressive. I don't know why. Brian, do you have my music ready? Oh, no, I don't. I, I always feel awkward asking for it. I wait for Craig to do it. Why? Just ask for the damn music, dude. Is okay. this it? I don't really care what it is, honestly. The finishes on this show were Submission After Distraction Clean Pin Clean Pin Pin with Feet on the Ropes Clean Pin Pin After Interference And finally, Pin After a Ref Bump and a Chair Shot and Interference and all sorts of other bullshit Hey, at least we got to finish in a Nitro Main Event Yeah It's overlining Newsworthy Frankly, as far as newsworthy finishes go, wait till we get to this Raw Let's see 